So why don't we get started? Um, thank you all for coming, and thanks to there's a few folks on Zoom, and as the day wears on, I'm sure the population both in the room and remotely will grow. Um, for those of you who haven't done this before, and for our guests, we um, we try to take one session each semester uh, of these regular symposia and devote them to students and postdocs. And the result is that the day is an even broader collection of topics than is our usual. Um, and uh, I think that's fun. And it's an opportunity for people to scratch themselves and learn about things outside their own fields. Um, so there was a committee of people who uh, surveyed all the applications and, and we have nine speakers today. So everybody gets half an hour. I think you've been advised, prepare 20 minutes and the audience will do the rest. Um, uh, we encourage polite interruptions. Um, it is the speaker's right to say, no, wait, I'll, <laughs> I'll get to that. Um, so let's get started. Uh, our first speaker is Anupam Mandal from Rice University, and he's going to talk about timing and cell lysis. Thank you, Bill, for the introduction. Good morning, all. I'm Anupam Mandal from Kolomiski's lab at Rice University. Honored to be here. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, all the organizers uh, for giving me this opportunity to present my work here. I'm going to talk about molecular mechanisms of precise timing in cell lysis. It is relatively known that several biological processes exhibit a remarkable precision in the timing of many cellular events, such as cell differentiation, gene expression, cell site regulation, bacterial sporulation, and many more. Now, in all of these processes, it is observed that some, uh, some regulatory proteins, uh, uh, they accumulate within the cell, and after some time, uh, it reaches the, that uh, after some time the, it reaches to a threshold concentration at a precise timing. Now, uh, 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 so this observation of uh, reaching to a threshold concentration at a precise timing is very surprising because all biological system exhibit uh, or rely on a large number of biophysical and biochemical processes that are taking place in a completely stochastic environment. So one of the most well-known exam ex example of reaching to a uh, 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 threshold concentration or, or, or the precise timing is cell lysis by lambda bacteriophage viruses. So this cell lysis is a process by which a bacteriophage causes the host bacterial cell to rupture. So this bacteria, so this, this bacteriophage, after infecting the bacterial cell, the uh, virus, uh, 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 the virus stimulates the host uh, to produce this holin protein. So this holin protein is produced by this S gene in the lambda promoter region. So this holin protein, they enter uh, uh, the, uh, this uh, inner membrane uh, uh, progressively. And after uh, uh, some time, uh, so they, uh, they, uh, when, when their uh, concentration reaches to a critical threshold, they aggregate among them, themselves and form these kind of irregular holes of size approximately 350 nanometer. So after forming this hole, this endolysis, endolysin pro, uh, enzyme uh, produced by this uh, R, -G, uh, R gene uh, they enter through this uh, hole and they attack the peptidoglycan cell wall. After that, this scanning protein produced by RJ gene, they fuse this inner and outer membrane and causes the bacterial cell to death. Here, uh, you can see a movie of uh, cell lysis. Yeah, so it's boom. So uh, so this uh, this is recorded from a single cell experiment. So the cell is infected at time t equal to zero and it is lysed at approximately 80 minutes. Now in this recent uh, single molecule paper, uh, they have uh, the, the, the investigated the, the, the precise timing of cell lysis using fast passage approaches. So, uh, uh, so uh, they analyzed, uh, 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 they, they analyzed the, the holine accumulation in wild type holine uh, for uh, over 100 defined individual cells. And uh, they observed that the holine accumulation reaches to a threshold concentration for the first time. 
So out of all these trajectories, uh, uh, when they reaches to a threshold concentration, so this histogram will actually will give you uh, the distribution of lysis time. And if you take uh, the, the average over this, uh, this distribution, you will get the mean lysis timing. Now, after that, uh, they uh, introduced mutations in the holine protein. So they did the point mutation along different positions of this holine sequence. Uh, and they uh, analyzed over 100 individual uh, cells uh, to obtain the to obtain the um, uh, lysis timing uh, for uh, for defined mutants. So uh, so uh, in this figure, you can see that introducing mutations can decrease the lysis timing compared to wild type. Also, if you introduce mutations, the lysis timing can be increased as well. So uh, and also they have found that introducing mutations can increase or decrease this threshold. So it is proposed that if you introduce mutations, uh, uh, that might affect the holine insertion ability into the membrane, holine-holine uh, affinity, and also the nucleation of holine inside the membrane. And that might cause this cell lysis time variation. However, uh, uh, the, what is the microscopic origin of this threshold and the precise timing has not been, uh, has not been addressed yet. So there are many theoretical studies uh, uh, where uh, they tried to address this question. Uh, and and in, in all of these theoretical studies, uh, they assumed a fixed threshold in their theories. And they assumed this fixed threshold from the beginning of the theory, uh, at the beginning of the theory. So, and therefore due to the phenomenological nature, the microscopic origin of this threshold and precise timing cannot be addressed. So to fill this gap, we uh, uh, developed a discrete state stochastic model of cell lysis where the system is characterized by a set of n discrete states. So, uh, uh, so, the, so each of these states represent the number of holines present in the inner membrane. So the system starts with zero holine and this holine number is, uh, uh, is increased by one with rate k. So this rate k is basically the holine accumulation rate. I, uh, I, I, and this rate combines several other processes such as diffusion of holine inside uh, into, the, into the cytoplasm plasmic membrane, entering into the membrane and spreading within the membrane. Now this R is the lysis rate and this lysis rate uh, is proportional to the number of holines present in the system. And one of the, uh, and the main difference of our, uh, of our uh, theoretical model with uh, compared to other model is that this lysis can happen at any number of holine present in the system. So here I want to emphasize that so our model is the is a is a minimal model and in this model we did not consider the holine degradation rate and it is because the experiment suggests that uh, a holine protein is is a relatively stable protein and it does not degrade over relevant time scale. So, uh, uh, so for this uh, model, we uh, wrote the master equations and uh, using a fast passage calculation, we are uh, finally able to derive the, uh, the fast passage probability distribution of lysis time, the mean fast passage time for lysis, and also the, the coefficient of variation or the noise in lysis timing. And most importantly, all these quantities are also uh, measured in experiment as well. So here we first try to understand the origin of uh, this threshold-like uh, dynamics in cell lysis. And this can be understood with the following argument. So, uh, so, so the probability for cell lysis to occur in this, in this state n is, so this nr divided by some of uh, the all other rates, nr plus k. And this you can write as n by n plus x, where is x is, is, is equal, x is basically the uh, ratio between only insertion and uh, and the and the lysis rate and this is uh, this is, so this x is basically the coupling constant between the holine accumulation and the holine removal now once you have this quantity then you can find the probability to have cell lysis exactly when there are n holine proteins in the membrane so this quantity q in this quantity qn this product is basically uh, when uh, so uh, there are no when there are no lysis even up to the states n n minus one which is happening with the probability one minus p and then there is the lysis event at the state n which is happening with uh, probability p n so this quantity we plotted here with for uh, some uh, realistic value of the coupling constant x so this x axis is the experimentally observed range of holine numbers 
uh, and, and within this range, uh, you can see that there is a narrow distribution of the number of holes. And this uh, red line is drawn at the maximum of this distribution at which the cell lysis is most probable to occur. Uh, so, uh, so this behavior uh, is, 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 is similar to the existence of threshold and this comes naturally into the system, into this model. So, uh, so, uh, so we, we can easily uh, associate this, uh, this maximum in the distribution with the threshold values observed in real system. And, uh, and this simple argument suggests that the coupling, uh, stochastic coupling between the holine accumulation and holine removal uh, leads, to a, leads to an effective threshold-like dynamics. Now we wanted to uh, get an, uh, get a dynamic view of the cell lysis dynamics, and for that we utilize the raw data of uh, 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 taken from experiments. So this raw data is taken from experiments. So the raw data of lysis timing. So uh, uh, so in the in, in this experiment they have considered wild type folin and different other uh, mutants of folin. And so this distribution is basically the experimental uh, uh, is obtained from the experimental lysis timing data. And this uh, our theoretical uh, uh, distribution of lysis timing is fitted to each of these distribution for wild type polyne and for a particular mutant I have shown here. And this fitting is shown for all other mutants uh, uh, they, that, that are considered uh, in the experiment. And, uh, and, and we fitted our theoretical uh, data uh, model uh, with, the, with, the, with the experimental data. And we checked also the goodness of fit of all these fittings using Kolmogorov spin up test. So uh, the KA statistics and the P value for each of these fitting is shown in each, each panel. So the, a lower value of KA statistics and a P value greater than 0 0.05 .05 suggests a good fit to the experimental data. And in all of these cases, you can see that both of these conditions are, are satisfied. So suggesting a good fit to the experimental data. Now, out of all this fitting, we extracted the optimized kinetic parameters for wild type holine and for all other mutants, uh, holine mutants considered in the experiment. And uh, uh, in, you can see that the holine insertion rate for, for uh, in this list varies two orders of magnitude, whereas the lysis rate in this list is varies within the same order of magnitude. And if you notice this wild type, the holine insertion rate has a higher value, but it is not the highest in this list. Similarly, the, the lysis rate, in the, uh, it, it, it has a lower value, but it is not the lowest in this list. However, their coupling, the, the coupling between K and R, which is the X, for wild type, it shows the highest value among all other mutants. We also uh, considered the, the number of holins uh, or the average number of holins required before cell lysis, and we found that for wild type, it requires the, the highest number of holins. Uh, before the cell lysis. So here we uh, we have uh, we found that holin uh, wild type holin shows the largest number of holins before cell lysis. Now we try to understand that why this coupling for wild type has the highest value and why there is a need for the uh, uh, highest number of holins for uh, for wild type holin. So uh, to uh, so to for that we uh, plotted noise as a function of the average number of holins. So as we increase the average number of holins, the noise decreases and our theoretical result perfectly agrees uh, with the uh, experiment. And you can see that for wild type holin, the noise is the minimum and, and, uh, and, and, and it is having the highest number of holins. In panel B, we plotted the noise as a function of mean lysis time. And you can see that for wild type holin, the noise is minimum but the lysis timing is not the fastest. So there are mutations or, or mutants uh, where the, you can find the uh, fastest, uh, uh, faster uh, lysis timing, but in all these cases, the, the noise is, is larger. So uh, this result suggests that there is a trade-off between the precision and the speed of the cell lysis. So uh, if you want to have uh, the highest precision into the system, then you have to compromise with the with the speed uh, of cell lysis, and this is what exactly happening for wild type system. So, uh, and if you want to have the uh, highest kinetics or highest speed of cell lysis, then 
definitely you have to compromise with the precision. And this is what exactly happening for all other mutants. So uh, this result suggests that, uh, so if you want to have uh, uh, a, a balance between uh, 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 between the precision and speed of cell lysis, that will actually give you the optimal condition. So now we try to understand that why there is a minimum in the a minimum noise for wild type folding. And to understand that, we uh, did a bootstrapping analysis. So again, we uh, utilized the experimental, experimental data. So uh, from the experimental data, we choose 80% uh, of the data, uh, our original data randomly. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, uh, and we uh, get this histo uh, and, and we uh, 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 get the histogram and in each bootstrapping iteration, so which I uh, which we run a uh, uh, thousand uh, bootstrapping iterations, and in each iteration we choose eighty percent data. We, uh, uh, we we draw the histogram and we fit the theoretical curve and get the uh, number of polling cities required. And and from uh, and from uh, all the iterations, we uh, plotted the special distribution of polling numbers for wild type polling, and a particular mutant is shown here. And uh, and then once you have the, the spatial distribution of polling numbers, uh, then you can find the average and the uh, standard errors, which are uh, often uh, in, in terms of confidence interval. Uh, so uh, so this average number for wild type polling and for all other mutants is shown here. So this error bar is basically so around the mean, mean how much it is fluctuating. So uh, you can see that the average number of polling for wild type protein, it has the highest value but this error bar is very, very low. So, uh, uh, but for all other cases, the error bar are very, uh, very uh, um, uh, large. So uh, it suggests that this wild type holine try to accumulate as large possible holine in the system and tune their spatial distribution as narrow as possible. And this together will lead to a very low level of temporal noise and very high precision in breaking the membrane. And for all these mutants, either one or both of these conditions are not satisfied. And this is the reason that uh, uh, the, for wild type holine, uh, the, the, the noise is minimum with the highest number of holines it is required. So in a nutshell, we conclude that we introduced a minimal stochastic model that takes into account the most relevant physical and chemical processes such as holine accumulation, holine uh, uh, removal. And here we want to emphasize that uh, in real system, there might be other transitions in the system that might quantitatively affect uh, the quantitative prediction of our results. But we believe that the main physical, physical conclusions with this minimal model will remain same. We uh, have shown that coupling between the holine accumulation and the holine removal leads to an effective threshold-like dynamics in the system. We also have shown that there is a narrow range of uh, uh, holine concentration in the membrane at which cell lysis can be observed. And this exactly corresponds to thresholds observed in real biological system. Uh, we also uh, have uh, found that wild type system accumulate as large holine as possible in the, in the, in the membrane before cell lysis while keeping their spatial distribution as narrow as possible. And that lead to a very low level of temporal noise and very high precision in breaking the bacterial membrane. Uh, and also our theoretical analysis suggests that there is a trade-off between precision and speed of cell lysis. And we propose that nature optimize the uh, cell lysis for lambda bacterial phase to achieve the highest possible temporal precision while keeping the to tolerable speeds of the process. Uh, so uh, I'm working with uh, uh, Anatoly Kolobisky, so this is our uh, full group. Uh, I sincerely thank uh, uh, the Kani Graduate Center and also the CPBF at Princeton University for uh, providing uh, me the funding to present this work here. And I also thank NSF and Welch Fund Foundation uh, for the research funding, and thank you all. Yes. So way back at the beginning, when you showed this, uh, you, you worked out that was it the distribution for the first passage time the, the and yeah, let me go back. It, is that minimum, the minimum we've been talking about the second half of the talk, does that appear in your analytic calculation? If you tune something, is there a minimum or maximum? Uh, you mean this? 
Yeah. Uh, Does this model predict the minimum noise? Yeah. So the, yeah. So this minimum noise is here. Uh, let me go back. Yeah. So you are talking about this one. Yeah, but from your analytic, from your minimal model, does it pop out from there? Yeah. So. Uh, uh, so uh, this uh, this uh, this uh, theoretical curve is is from the, uh, is, is from our minimum minimum model and and it uh, so for wild type volume uh, the noise is minimum and uh, and we fitted the experimental data and we uh, it, it perfectly agrees yeah yeah yes, uh, just out of curiosity the mutants that you chose. Were they randomly chosen or did you notice? Ah, so yeah, so the mutations I didn't chose. The mutations are often, I, I mean, I have uh, taken from experiments, but I have no idea on what basis they did mutations in several in defined positions. Yeah, so uh, I, I I do not know uh, the 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 position that they have mutated mutated why they have chosen that specific position. I have no idea. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you have any idea of what you would say the pressure that pushes the page to try to have this very precise control uh, control? But it feels like you wouldn't like to lie too soon because you want to be in a page particle to be able to spread them in the environment. Yeah. But why does it need to be so precise? This is something uh, I don't have really clear idea about. So I'd be curious. Yeah. So uh, so. So uh, the, the so this is the bacterial phase. So if you uh, you want to accumulate the volume. Uh, I mean, a as large as possible. So if you if you want to accumulate, uh, let's say, a maximum number of pollens, then definitely your uh, you you will you will take more time, right? But if you want to have uh, uh, so so if you so if you want to have a low noise, so it is uh, shown so shown here. So for example, in this figure, let me go back. Yeah. So here, so you can see that this wild type pollen the the timing is uh, is is not the minimum so in 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 these mutants they they are uh, uh, i mean they are uh, so their uh, timing is not uh, is is uh, uh, greater compared to this wild type holine so uh, so the, the the thing is that so when this holine protein they accumulate in a in a wild type system they accumulate in such a way that that uh, it keeps a balance between this uh, precision and, uh, and, and and the speed, and and they try to accumulate uh, this whole in, in in such a way that they they try to uh, maintain a, a a very narrow spatial distribution of whole in numbers. And in in all other mutants, there is a sufficient flux. So when they accumulate, the the fluctuation in the uh, and in the spatial distribution is more. And because of this, uh, uh, because of this uh, higher fluctuation in the spatial distribution, their uh, noise for uh, noise for other mutants is larger compared to wild type. So this, you see, this distribution is very very narrow. So they try to accumulate the whole in as large possible into the system, and and at the same time they are trying to uh, maintain the, the the their distribution as narrow as possible. Yeah. Okay. Um, my question was rather, why do they try to do that? Like, is there sort of an obvious ability pressure that would push them to do? Uh, so yeah, so this is still an open. So we are trying to uh, understand in uh, some other uh, ways. Uh, so uh, we are uh, looking at the structural aspect of the, the, this thing. So this is a minimum model. Only we can conclude about, uh, I mean, uh, this uh, quantitative prediction. But if you want to have a structural uh, uh, explanation, then I, we are working on that. And we found that, uh, so this whole in protein, if I go back, let me show you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this holine protein, it has three transmembrane domains, TND1, 2, and 3. And out of these three transmembrane domains, we found this, that this TMD3, it is more amphiphatic in nature compared to other T, uh, TMD domains, right? And also we found that this TMD domain, the, the, the sequence of this TMD domain, they are less frustrated compared to other TMDs. So when they form the dimerization, this TMD3 domain actually uh, help, uh, actually takes uh, part into the dimerization process, but uh, but uh, we we do not know exactly uh, the molecular mechanism of that dimerization. So we believe that because it is uh, so uh, the wild type holine try to accumulate as large possible holine as possible. So after some time, there should be some sort of cooperativity into the uh, holine accumulation. But still, it is not. Uh, Experimentally observed, also uh, not explained yet, but we, we believe that there should be some sort of cooperativity in the system that 
uh, might lead to this kind of aggregation and form this whole uh, and, and cell lysis at the end. Yeah. Yes. Before we have, I just want to start with a follow the description. Uh, so, like, does the wall type have like bigger thickness? Are they like like doing any better, any worse than the than the, the other mutations? Uh, uh, so, uh, this is like is it like a uh, pressure to go from the wild type to something else, or from the mutation to the wild type, or it is just not observed yet or not studied yet. Yeah, the fitness, uh, regarding the fitness, uh, uh, I have no idea about the fitness of, of this system. Yeah, but uh, I, I, I need to check about, about this, all this, yeah, these fitness things. Yes. I had, I had two questions. One, since this plot is up here, uh, I don't know whether the plot on the left is, is model or data, but um, when you measure the time, you have to tell me when time zero is. And it's, I don't know whether, so how how well defined is the zero time? Yes, yeah, so uh, so the time is, uh, yeah. So in the experiment, uh, the zero time, uh, I think this, uh, I, I, I mean, uh, this lysis induction, uh, so I, I have no idea about this uh, experimental lysis induction time. So yeah, so uh, after expressing the volume, so uh, so the, then they accumulate, uh, their, their concentration accumulate in the membrane, right? So uh, once they start the expressing, then they are, they are uh, I mean, the number of polyps is getting accumulated. And when once so they- I understand what happens after. I was wondering how, you, how zero gets defined and I guess a related question is whether the the time from zero to the start of expression looks even more precise than the than the time, right? The time of which expression starts looks looks very sharply defined in this plot. Yeah, I, I you mean this video? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so uh, yeah, so I uh, need to check uh, uh, I mean the experimental paper that how uh, they uh, uh, defined, but uh, so the, so and the, so the, when the volume starts, I I think this uh, I mean all these things starts from here. So uh, yeah, I, I a, a related question is: Do the experiments that measure the accumulation of pollen give you an absolute number of molecules? Or they only no, them? no. So uh, in 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 a in a in a, in a PNS paper, uh, let me show you the paper here. Yeah, here is the paper. So in this PNS paper, uh, the uh, the number of polyps that they measure, they measure, uh, they uh, uh, provided a range. So these uh, uh, holin uh, numbers they range from fifty to one thousand uh, molecules in a, in a, in, a, in a real system. Yeah, and our uh, theoretical model uh, uh, and uh, the num average number of polyps that we obtain in our theory uh, falls within those. Uh, I mean, uh, region. So it, it varies from 50 to 1,000 molecules. So for example, you have 10% fluctuations in the time, and you have 100 molecules, and that's what fits together. Yeah. If you have 10% fluctuations in the time and 1,000 molecules, then there's missing sort of more. Mm, yeah, so uh, uh, you- I, I guess what I'm wondering is, is it possible from the experiment to pin down the absolute number? I mean, you have a, it seems like you have a very clear prediction of what the absolute number is. Yeah. So is it possible to push, you know, to dig into the data and ask if they can, if they can do better in the absolute number? Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so in this experiment, they did not uh, measure uh, any uh, absolute number of holy, holy numbers. So we uh, utilized this data and we, with this uh, theoretical model, we uh, provided a quantitative, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, result that how uh, much holy is required uh, uh, to have the cell lysis. So in this experiment, they did not measure it, but we, uh, whatever we have predicted, uh, with the, it agrees with the previous uh, range of, uh, of holy numbers. Yes, you. Uh, I think it's a related question, but um, what about sort of so like the process that not all the cells are going to be like at the same concentration of the 
Yeah. Yeah. So this uh, uh, this experiments. Uh, so this all these results. Let me show you. Yeah. So uh, they did uh, a single molecule experiment. So in in, in this experiment, they consider uh, more than hundred cell cells. So in each cells, there is a. Uh, I mean, if you start from some uh, from fixed time. There is a stochasticity in the system. So they analyzed 100, more than 100 different trajectories like this. And out of all these trajectories, they, uh, they obtained the uh, mean license time from a distribution. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, if uh, your distribution is more narrow, that means the variability will be less. If your distribution is much broader, so your variability, your variability will be much uh, I mean, uh, larger. Yeah. Um, sorry. Uh, everybody will be here all day, so, but we should try to keep it schedule. So let's do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, good. Um, so our next speaker is Emiliano Perez uh, Pina from John Hopkins, and he's going to talk about cell motility. So. Okay, um, I would like to start by thanking the organizers for giving the, the opportunity to present the work here. Uh, this talk is going to be about uh, the interplay between cell motility and the environment, and particularly of uh, how cells may use footprint to guide their own motion. So cells, they move in the extracellular matrix that is a 3D network structure uh, that is composed mainly by these collagen fibers. And as we see here, uh, the cell has they move over this network, they are going to pull and push for the fiber from, from the fibers and, and going to produce this deformation of the extracellular matrix. And not, not only that, cells can also degrade uh, the extracellular matrix and they can also secrete new extracellular matrix components. So that brings me to uh, this idea that there is a dynamic relationship between cell motility and the environment. Cells, so as they move, they're going to produce changes in their environment. And actually these changes can also produce uh, a change in the behavior of the cell, in particular in, in the way that they move. And a nice example of this uh, was observed in this paper over here from the Ladu, uh, Benoit Ladu group, when, where they place MDCK epithelial cells over this micro pattern where 1D uh, drugs that were coded with padronectin. Uh, then they observed the cells over these drugs over time. And what they found was something a bit unexpected. So in, instead of observing a random um, behavior of the cell, they observed something that looks much more deterministic. So cells start oscillating and these oscillations uh, increase with uh, the amplitude of, of these oscillations increase uh, on time. And to make this long story short, what they concluded was that what is driving this behavior is that the cells are leaving some type of footprint over the substrate and they are using the footprint to guide their motion. So the way it works is that the cell moves persistently when it's crawling over the footprint but when they arrive to the edge of the footprint, they're going to stop and repolarize and start moving in the opposite direction. So basically the cell is kind of bouncing between the two boundaries of the footprint and the amplitude, uh, the increasing amplitudes uh, are explained because every time that the cell hit the boundary is going to extend it a bit longer. So this brings us to the question that uh, we want to address here is the first one is how cells uh, can use the footprint to produce this oscillatory behavior. And in a more broad, broadly way, uh, what is the role of footprint in cell migration? Uh, can cells use footprint to control and change the motility behavior in different instances? And also, can this be a collective guidance mechanism? So cells can use cells use footprint to guide other cells. And to try to answer this question, we built uh, a model where cells 
are going to secrete the footprint and interact to, with this footprint to change their motility behavior. This model is going to have three components. A first component that describes the slow motion. A second component that is describing the dynamic of the footprint. And a third component that is basically telling uh, how the footprint affects the motility of the cell. So to describe the, the motility of the cell, we use a phase field approach. Um, in the phase field approach, the cell is described by a field that can take the value one inside the cell and zero outside the cell. And then the cell boundary is defined where this field takes a value uh, equal to a half. And then we can write an equation for the evolution of the field as we have here. And this equation has basically two terms. The first term is what drives the motility. And uh, to make it simple, uh, we can understand that the cell is going to extend on those regions where the concentration of the polarity protein that we are going to call rack is high. The second term is just energy minimization, where we have our energy function that just has two terms. They have this double well potential that's basically defining the inside and outside of the cell. And then we are also asking the cell to minimize the linear tension. Um, so as I said, the motility of the cell is, is driven by these uh, polarity proteins that we call RAC. And RAC can be in two states, can be in, in an active state that is going to bound, be bound to the membrane of the cell and is going to accumulate at the front, driving the motion. Can be also in an active state that is going to be distributed all along the cytosol. And the dynamic of the, the active rack is, is uh, basically describing this equation. So the rack is going to diffuse over the membrane, but can also convert to inactive and active rack uh, following this equation. And the most important thing to note here is that we are adding this positive feedback by this arrow here, and that is going to allow that the cell can sustain a polarity over time. And that allows the cell to have some directionality uh, motion over time. For the foot footprint dynamic, we use a, a simple model. Uh, we assume that cell is going to secrete the footprint under its surface with a given secretion rate. And we also assume that there is going to be some degradation of the footprint. Um, we also assume that the footprint, that the cell doesn't directly respond to the footprint. Um, this is motivated by the fact that the cell probably is going to bind to the footprint using some receptors over the surface, like interview, for example. So we're assuming that the cell is going to respond to the footprint following a function like this. And you can see the function, the response function over here as a function of the, um, the concentration of the footprint. So for that, as I said, we need to say how the footprint affect the, the behavior of the cell or, or, or the cell motility. And for that, we assume a very simple case that the footprint is uh, entering over here. So it's promoting the positive feedback. Uh, we can also hear, see here in, uh, on the question. And the way that this is going to work is if the cell is crawling over um, a place where it's a footprint, uh, in that case, this positive feedback mechanism is going to be on and the cell is going to be able to sustain a polarity at the front and it's going to be able to, to move. But when the cell arrives to a place where there is no footprint, now this positive feedback is not working, the cell can sustain the polarity and eventually it's going to stop. So now I, I, I will show you some of the results that we found with the model. So the first thing that we did, we model uh, we mimic the experimental condition. So we build our uh, our 1D track and we place the cells over there. And here on the left, we are seeing the cell. Um, the color map represents the activity of the rack that is driving the motility. And you can see how the cell is oscillating and uh, is increasing the oscillations, uh, the, the amplitudes of the oscillation with time. Here on the right, you can see the footprint. And you can see that the footprint uh, is all over those places where the cell has been before. And you can see how the footprint extends every time that the cell hit the boundary. So we can see that in a bit more of detail. So when the cell is reaching to the, the boundary of the footprint, 
uh, is coming with a given velocity, it's polarized. But when it hits the boundary, since there is no footprint at the front, um, the cell is going to slow down, it's going to shrink, and eventually it's going to lose the polarity at the front. And since there is more footprint on the other side that was coming, the, the cell is going to prefer to repolarize in the opposite direction, and it's going to uh, start going on the other way. And we can see that during this process, how the footprint got extended at a certain distance. And this was, was something that we were not expecting, but this is actually uh, something that was, was observed in, on the experiment. So here we have the MDCK cell and the color map represent the activity of rock. So you can see kind of the same picture of the cell that is polarized, hitting the boundary and repolarized and, and going in the opposite direction. Uh, so it, it came out that one of the important parameters of our model seems to be the secretion rate. The secretion rate plays an important role here. So I'm going to show you a movie of um, a cell with a high secretion rate. And now what we see is that the cell, instead of oscillating, now the cell is, is moving persistently, even though uh, even advancing into, into regions where this, there was no previous footprint. And we can understand this as since the cell is secreting so much footprint that it's being able to build the footprint, the necessary footprint that you need to keep moving on, even though uh, there was no previous footprint before. And I think that the cartoon kind of give you the idea pretty, pretty well, probably much more, much better than I just explained it. Um, so basically what we found is that there is a transition between an oscillatory behavior and a persistent uh, motion that is controlled by how fast the cell can secrete a footprint. Um, but it also can be controlled by this other uh, parameter that is PD, that is basically the amount of footprint that the cell needs to generate a response. So basically we can build this phase diagram. And I, I just want to highlight this line that is um, separating the, the transition between oscillation to persistent motion uh, that happened in this linear relation. And this is something I'm, I'm going to come back later. And so, so far I show you simulations where there were no degradation. Uh, and this was motivated also on the experiment. So in the experiment, they, they observed that the footprint is quite stable and it doesn't degrade on the, during the time of the experiment. But now we are just playing around and, and we assume that the footprint can degrade. And what we observe now is that our cell, instead of oscillating with an increasing amplitude, now the cell is going to oscillate and reach a steady state amplitude. And we can understand that if we pay uh, if we take a look to the footprint, so basically now the cell cannot keep moving further away because now when, when it tries to come back to the previous um, edge, it finds out that this, the footprint is no longer there and it has to rebuild it. So this degradation basically confines the cell to oscillate in, in a given region. And um, we can see that uh, this steady state amplitude depends uh, how, depend, how they depend on the degradation rate. So the higher the degradation rate, basically the more confined are, are the cells. So we want you to build a model that allows us to get a bit more of insight. So the other model was really nice to see this, the motion of the cell, the shape of the cell, but it was pretty complicated to get some analytical results. So for that reason, we built a much simpler model. And in this model, we have a cell that's moving over the lattice. And this cell is following very simple rules, deterministic rules. There is no noise here. Uh, so this cell is moving to the right here in this example. And at each time step, it's going to ask the question, is the footprint larger than 0 0.5? If that's the case, the cell is going to make the next step in the same direction it was coming. If the answer is no, it's going to turn around and move to in the other direction. So this is just an example of, so you can have an idea how this works. So we have the 
uh, a fixed footprint here that is equal to one all over this region. And we have the cell that is at each time asking the question, is the footprint larger than 0 0.5? Yes. And it's keep moving to the right until you reach the edge. And now since there is no footprint, it's going to turn around and it's going to start moving all over uh, this region until it gets to this point. So basically this cell is going to keep oscillating between these two boundaries. But of course, we want also that our cell secrete the footprint. So we are including that. We include the decision uh, of the footprint, and we also assuming that there is some variation. And now we can use the model to understand what are the conditions that the cell has to fulfill to be in a steady state. Uh, so for that, we stand in the edge of the oscillations. And in order to keep the steady state, we know that the amount of footprint that the cell secrete at that side has to be equal to the same footprint that is degraded during the time that the cell goes to the other edge and come back. So this is what we wrote over here. And from this expression, we can uh, compute an expression for the amplitude, the steady state amplitudes. And even though that this was uh, a very simple model, it was very powerful predicting some relationship of the uh, more complex model. So basically we can predict how the steady state of uh, amplitude depends on the degradation rate, but also we can predict where the transition from oscillation to persistent motion is going to happen. And this is given basically by, by this term that is predicting this relation and this line over here. Okay, so then we move to to these simulations, and uh, it would be nice that the toy model worked well uh, for two D, but that was not the case. So we went back to our full model simulations, and here on, on the left, I'm showing you a simulation of a cell in the case of low secretion rate. So this is the analogous case of the oscillations in one D. And uh, now in this case, what we see is that the cell is moving in circles. It's performing this uh, circular motion. And we can see how the circles are expanding over time. So this is very similar to the case in, in, in 1D where we have the increasing amplitude. Here we have circles that expands over time. Uh, but now if we increase the secretion rate, we have uh, our cell that is able to start exploring the space, but it's actually a bit more complicated than that because now when the cell finds the previous path, instead of keep moving on, it's just going to turn around and start moving over the previous path. And it's not only that, it's also being looped uh, by the footprint, but now it takes the other direction uh, and start exploring again. So we have this kind of um, interesting dynamic exploratory dynamics of the cell in this case, where the cells are exploratory, but at the same time, they have some preference to keep moving over previous uh, path. Um, these are old cells that are cells? Oh, these are just simulations. Okay, so yeah, so these are um, not experiments. I'm going to go for the experiments right now. Oh yeah. And uh, once the, the, the footprint is saturated, like there is no reinforcement of the fact like they could deposit several times footprint. Yeah. So basically they saturate the footprint and that's it. And in this case there is no degradation, so the footprint is going to remain stable. Uh so coming back to the question, we went back to see uh, actually what was happening in the experiments. So we contact um Joseph D'Alessandro and Benoit, Benoit Ladu, that they were the ones that made the original experiment. And they asked them for the trajectories of the cells uh, into the substrate. And since the cells were oscillating over the 1D track, we were expecting by prediction of our model that in 2D, they should be moving in these expanding circles. And that's actually what we found. Cells are moving in expanding circles. But this was not always the case. So actually that was a weird case, a rare case. In general, what we observe is that the, the, the cells, they move in these more random trajectories with showing some of this overlap that we see previously from, uh, from the movie. 
So this is suggesting actually that cells should be above the transition uh, point. So we were a bit puzzled what was going on. So we went back to our, our model and what we found was that th this transition is actually happening at two different secretion rates in 1D and 2D. So um, basically that allows different combinations uh, of behaviors between 1D and 2D. So for example, we can have oscillations in 1D and circular motion in 2D, but we can also have uh, oscillatory motion in 1D and exploratory motion in 2D as we observe uh, on the experiments. So these um, results, uh, these observations from the experiments suggest, according to our model, that these MDCK cells should be slightly above the transition point. So they should be close to the uh, to the transition point. Also, the fact that we observe both type of trajectories, about both type of behavior, suggests the same thing that cells should be close to the transition point because then cell to cell variability can explain why we have some cells that behave in exploratory way and some cells that behave in a circular way. So lastly, uh, we measure the mean square displacements uh, for our uh, model for different secretion rates. Uh, here at the bottom, what we are seeing is the case of the circular trajectories. So this is the low secretion rate. And what we found is uh, so diffusive behavior with these two third exponents. If we go up to the high secretion rate, what we found is a more um, persistent random walker um, type of motion uh, where we have the ballistic phase and then the transition to the diffusion phase. But in the middle, for those cases that are, are slightly above the transition phase, we are observing this uh, diffusive behavior with an exponent that is something close between one and two thirds. And this is also consistent to what they observe in the experiment uh, in this flat curve where they observe this type of uh, subdiffusion uh, behavior, subdiffusion behavior with this, an exponent that is something between one and two thirds. Again, suggesting that uh, the cells on the experiment are tuned close to the secretion at uh, the transition point. And with that, I would like to conclude. Basically, we were able to build uh, this model where cells can secrete and interact with the footprint. And we observed that we can have different type of motility behaviors from persistent motion to oscillatory motion in 1D, a circular motion, and this um, interesting self-attracting exploratory behavior in 2D. Um, we also observed those behaviors in the experiments. And our model suggests that these MDCK cells should be slightly they should be tuned slightly about the transition point. And with that, I would like to thank um, Professor Candy and our collaborators, Joseph Alessandro and Benola Lu. Thank you very much, and I would be happy to take questions. Uh, we, we have to think about it. No, we, we did not did the simulations of degradation in 2D, um, but I guess that could give very interesting results. So for example, in the circular case, we what we would expect in is that basically the cell keep increasing the, the circles, but in, at the center, the footprint get degraded. So it's going to end being kind of a wing of footprint where the cell is moving. Uh, in, two, in the case of high secretion rate, it might be a bit, a bit more complicated because then uh, the footprint is getting degraded. And that's where I saw it. So. <laughs> so I would guess that um, the self-attraction uh, to the previous footprint uh, is going at some point is going to stop working because the degradation of the cell. So the cell is so this footprint what gives the cell is some type of memory of what they where they have been in the past. So the, the degradation basically it's how 
how long the past your memory can go, basically. Uh, yeah, so there are questions over there. So then you can come back. So um, in the experiment, they are not sure actually. Uh, this aspect, so they observed that cells are secreting fibronectin and laminin, uh, but they also know that knocking out fibronectin didn't uh, prevent observing the oscillation. So it's not fibronectin, might be laminin, but uh, they are not sure actually. Uh, yes. Um, when you when you drew the cartoon for the phase build model, it looked like you were drawing a three D cell. Do your phase build? Are you doing? Do the cells have heights? Or, or did I misinterpret the picture? Which which the cartoon at the very beginning? There is a drawing of. A oh, cell. that's yeah, that's a cartoon only. Uh, no, okay. this is just a two D model. Okay. So the, the, there is no third dimension. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> there are many so many stuff. Yeah. Yep. Uh, great. So in the experiment you first show the oscillation is able to growing amplitude, and that seems like a point of comparison that you could make to your your theory I never saw to compare the radius of the amplitude and growing. Oh, amplitude. yeah. So we 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 didn't show it uh, here, but yeah, we did it, and we observed that um, our amplitude can grow, and we can actually fit our model to fit. How the amplitude grows in the in the experiment. Yeah. That we feel something about the degradation rate. So the degrad so basically on the on the experiment they measure the degradation and basically there is no degradation. So the footprints stay there during the whole time of the, of the on the experiment. So actually the paper is uh, is called long lived footprint basically. So they don't degrade during the time of the experiment. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, it's yeah yeah so yeah. Um, Sorry, I, I didn't okay. say that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a linear growth. Yeah. Uh, do you expect to uh, like patients to also hold out their tumor? Uh, I don't know that. We are, we are not sure what would happen. Uh, there are some experiments um, where they have been, they observed some type of oscill oscillatory motion in, in 3D. Actually, you can think about 3D, something very similar on 1D because kind of the cell is confined by the extracellular matrix. So it's kind of moving over the holes that are inside the extracellular matrix. So it might be possible that the cells um, move in, in, in oscillation. Some experiments in vivo using matrix shell, they also observe this type of oscillatory behavior. Uh, but in that case, it was not a footprint, but uh, a carp. Uh, basically, a degrading of, of the extracellular matrix, but the, the outcome is, is very similar. Uh, could you be more like the presentation of the results by like the uh, quantum computer, like it's like in 2D, it's like different classes, like 1D, so I would say that that would depend a lot of the 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 structure of the pretty network. So the the main difference between one D and two D is, is the shape of the cell. So in one D cells are much more elongated, and in two D cells are more, much more rounded. And we believe that that is causing uh, that the transition happen in different places. It's not that simple. We uh, we model um, cells with different uh, membrane tension, so that basically define the shape of the cell and the transition point change in a non-monotonous way, basically with that. But uh, we believe that um, the cell shape is playing an important role defining where this uh, transition point is taking place. Uh, uh, I think that, yeah, we can speculate a lot of, on that, uh, thinking of why cells would be would prefer to be close to a transition point. I think that there are, the advantages are, are pretty clear. So if you had to tune up you, your behavior due to a change in your environment or because you want to start doing a different, um, start a different motivated behavior, then you can 
it's much easier for you to do it if you're close to the transition point. So that makes us that being close, they can adjust the way that responds to the footprint and then become circularly um, be behaving in this circular motion or they can uh, be more exploratory. Can, can the transition, as you cross the transition, uh, With the with the you, you cross that finite frequency. Is it, is it half life? So you get a finite frequency, but the amplitude starts to zero. Or uh, I'm not sure if I get the question, but uh, when you the transition, uh, what happened? Uh, no, is the amplitude start uh, being more and more um, okay. so large. And this, the speed is, is always the same, so the, the frequency of the oscillation also is, is increasing. So basically you have like a, that the, the amplitudes start going kind of to infinity, very, in a very sharp way. And what's happening along the Like when- the frequency changing or? When you, no, so the frequency doesn't change because uh, that depends on the speed of the cell and, and the speed of the cell remains constant because that's defined basically by the, the parameter of the mold that we are not changing. Good. So our next speaker is William Schuttler who's coming to us from Amalf in, in Germany. And she's going to talk about the immune system. Cool. Thank you. Uh, really happy to be here uh, and really grateful for this opportunity to present my work. I am uh, Rhythm. I'm a postdoc in the Kanzinger group at Amalf. And today I'm going to be talking about reprogramming of intracellular pathways by various cars, which is a very mouthful title. So I'm going to simplify it and call it cancer and CAR T therapy. Let's see if I can take out my screen. Yeah, cancer and CAR T therapy. So uh, what exactly is cancer? Cancer is just a large group of diseases these days, more than 200 as they're classified, which is basically characterized by uncontrolled growth of cells and the spread of these uncontrollable, uh, uncontrolled growth of these cells. So how does this basically happen? Is that you have normal cells and then genetic changes happen, which lead to abnormal cells. These abnormal cells, although yeah. derivatives of the normal cells, uh, have some uh, genetic changes, but this also means that our immune system has a really hard time recognizing them since they are innate cells of our system as well. These abnormal cells multiply usually at a very high rate and then become something that looks like a tumor. Uh, since our immune system is not very capable of recognizing these cells, we need to give it some special, uh, you know, like weapons to basically recognize it. What does help us is that since these cells are genetically different from the original cells that they were derived from, they either overexpress certain uh, membrane uh, antigens or express some modified versions of these. And this is something that we can use to and exploit to generate a new type of therapy, which is called CAR-T therapy. So what are CAR-T cells and what is CAR-T cancer therapy? So CAR-T cancer therapy is a new type of therapy, which is uh, now, I think, FDA approved in 2017, so it's being used to treat cancer patients. Uh, CARs are basically chimeric antigen receptors, so that means that these are synthetic biosynthetic receptors that are made by putting together various parts as desired of, a, of any receptor that we like, and molecular biologists really find this fascinating, so they've come up with multiple generations of CARs already, I think up to four or five and that are being used to treat patients. The basic scheme of a CAR looks more or less very similar. So it has an antigen binding domain. So basically recognizes the cancer antigens that we want it to recognize. It has a transmembrane domain, which helps it, it to anchor into the membrane of the immune cells, a stimulatory and a post-stimulatory domain at times as well. Sometimes some CARs of the next generation also have multiple co-stimulatory domains as needed or as uh, seen fit for the detection and for the proliferation. So what we basically do is that we take these synthetic uh, and, uh, receptors and then we introduce them into this immune cells of the patients. 
So you ex uh, extract the immune cells, you uh, introduce these new receptors, and then you put these newly weaponized immune cells back into the patients, uh, which helps them to uh, detect the antigens of cancer better. So in my study, I'm working on these two cars. Both these cars are FDA approved and are currently being used to treat patients. These cars look very similar in structure. They have a high affinity binding domain. So the antigen that they recognize is called CD19, which is expressed in B cells in the blood of people. And uh, it gets overexpressed in people which have hemato-oncology problems. Uh, so this domain is a high affinity binding. So it sees it and it binds it with really high affinity. It has a C and they both have CD3 zeta domains, which are the signaling domains of also the innate T cell receptors which are present. And this has been shown to be very important to generate the immune response that is needed against cancer cells. The major difference between these two cars is the co-stimulatory domain. And although this looks very minor in the big structure, but these both these cars have been shown to sh uh, have very different clinical potencies. And in certain patients, one works better than the other. But why does this happen is not known. So the molecular mechanism of the cars has not been understood really well. And since they are based on the structure and have signaling domains, which are very similar to the innate T cell receptors, Till date, the belief is that CARs work like T cell receptors, but something is definitely making them more potent and also very uh, advantageous in recognizing these. So to understand that, I'm going to give you a brief overview of what T cell signaling pathway looks like. So if you assume that this is a immune cell and that is a T cell receptor, which also has the CD3 zeta domain, once it binds to the antigen that it can recognize, it initiates a cascade of reactions. The very first of the reactions is that a lot of molecules get recruited to this T cell receptor. Zap70 is one of these prominent molecules that initiates a lot of pathways eventually. So it gets phosphorylated, which means it becomes active. And then it is also responsible for a large amount of calcium flux that happens from the endoplasmic reticulum. This calcium flux uh, actually dephosphorylates NFAT, which is a, a transcription factor, uh, which helps in basically gene transcription within the nucleus. So NFAT, when it gets dephosphorylated, it goes into the nucleus and then causes gene transcription. In an alternate pathway, NF kappa B, which is another transcription factor, can also get activated. But for T cell signaling, NFAT is considered to be the major one that is uh, responsible for the immune response that happens in the cell. So over here in our study, we want to understand the signaling pathway that is involved. Since we already know so much about the T cell signaling pathway, we're going to base our study on the basis of the T cell receptors. We want to understand the similarities that these cars show uh, because most of their structure looks very similar, but we also want to understand the dissimilarities between these cars. I'm working on two cars at the moment, which have different co-stimulatory domains, but in our lab, we also work with cars which have different affinity binding domains. So there are some cars which bind with a lower affinity, but have shown to have a better potency against certain cancers. And then what is really interesting is that since these are all membrane receptors, they also, we don't know if they work as monomers or dimers or trimers, or if they form any sort of highly organized structures. So that is also something that we are interested in uh, realizing is the receptor organization on the membrane of it. So moving on, I'm going to explain the technical setup and I'm going to show, yes. Just a quick question. Is the car representing or detecting uh, like an antigen or like a representative peptide? An antigen on the surface of the cancer cells, yes. Is it what distinguishes it from the multi-cell receptor? Yes, so it is very direct and uh, it doesn't work how a T cell receptor would work where you need an MFC complex to be formed. It is like directly it detects the antigens, yes. Okay. Yeah. Can you explain why you fall for one of those questions in the chat about how effective car therapies are when, when the cancer cells mutate? Like, is there a question of adaptation speed in the That's a good question. Uh, when the cancer cells mutate, so the 
the the degree of uh, CAR T therapies already comes between 70 to 80, 90%, which is already quite high for any sort of cancer therapy. The problem with CAR T therapy is that since these are immune cells, they're present in the blood, they have a really hard time infiltrating solid tumors. So they're actually only very potent against fluid tumors, so to say, so blood tumors or B cell malignancies. Um, but when they mutate, uh, I think then you would need depends on which part of the antigen is mutating. So if it's the part that the domain can recognize, then maybe it won't make so much of a difference. But that's something that I really don't know about. I also don't know if there are a lot of studies done on it because these are really new therapies. So like four, five, five seven years old. So there's also not a lot of clinical data available to understand how it works that way. So I can explain the technical setup quickly, and then I'm going to go into a lot of experimental data that I've gathered. Uh, I've been in this lab for less than a year now, but I still have, think that the data we have is quite impressive. So most of the work that we do in the lab is single molecule tracking and high resolution microscopy. So we have a microscopy slide, and then on it, we make a lipid bilayer. And on the lipid bilayer, we present the antigens that the cars can recognize. So basically, this lipid bilayer acts as a mimic of the tumor cells. Then we introduce our uh, T cells, which contain these car receptors up, upon these lipid bilayers. And these receptors can then identify the antigens and bind to this lipid bilayer. This also helps us in getting a very planar structure which, in which, through which we can use Turf microscopy, and through turf microscopy, we can get a much higher resolution than any classical confocal microscopy technique. Uh, what is really important to understand is that since we are just started with this project, uh, we are at the moment using jerked cells. Jerked cells are model T cells that you can use. And, but the problem with jerked cells is that they have been shown to have really low LFA expression, which means that they're uh, binding to other uh, integrins or uh, other adhesion molecules is really low. So we also introduced an, a synthetic DNA adhesion system. So in this, we have a single DNA molecule hanging from the cells on the membrane and one on the lipid bilayer. So basically, you make a double-stranded DNA and the cells are bound. This technique also allows us to separate the adhesion process from the stimulation and activation process. So this is the basic setup that I'm going to use for most of the other experiments that I'm going to show in now. And uh, the process that we want to analyze in this experimental setup is the ZAP70 recruitment. Like I said, it's very important for T cell activation. So we want to see if CARs are capable of doing that. Uh, calcium flux and transcription factor uh, nuclei, nuclear trans uh, translocation as well. So uh, I will move one at a time and starting with the ZAP70. So since the cars are the structure and every particular part of the car structure is very important in the kind of work it does, we didn't want to modify the structure itself by adding a tag on it or in interfering with any of the processes that it might do. So what we did instead is that we introduced a tag on the ZAP70. So ZAP70 is halo label, so we can color it in whatever color we want and also on CD19. And uh, CD19, since it's present in the bilayer, it's already in a mobile element, but it's restricted to a, a 2D movement itself. So I guess my color choice wasn't that great, but, uh, and right now you can see that the, when the cell makes a contact, there is ZAP70 present and CD19, and they seem to co-localize really well. And I will play this video, and then you can also see that they both also move together. And this is something that has also been shown for T cell receptors is that they form this complex uh, uh, PSMAC as it co it's called, and then the movement of the receptors towards the inside and then the internalization as well, which is very important for deactivation. And so CARs show something very similar. Uh, what is very interesting for us, uh, maybe we can also compare it to already the data available is the size of these structures or the rate at which they dissolve uh, or get internalized as well. But we haven't done that yet. So now we know that ZAP70 is getting recruited. And now our next question was about calcium flux. So to do that, I'm also going to show you a data where 
the synthetic adhesion system is really going to make a lot of sense because this is a bilayer that contains the adhesion molecule ICAM. And technically, your cells should be able to bind to ICAM. But since uh, jerkid cells have very low uh, LFA expression, they don't really bind to the bilayer and are constantly moving around, not just in 2D, but also like not just in Z and Y, X and Y plane, but also in the Z plane. So then it becomes really difficult for us to do the analysis on these cells. So what we did is we introduced the addition system, and then I'm going to play this video twice. First, for you to appreciate the uh, addition efficiency of the synthetic system. So you can see that the cells really bind to the bilayer. We are able to get really good fluorescence from it. They're very stably bound, and they don't move a lot. And the second, you can also uh, appreciate that we get isolated cell at the density, and then we can also measure the intensity at which the calcium is being fluxed in and out of the cell at all times. And then to compare this to a system which has CD19 on it, uh, you will see that the cells bind much more efficiently because there's CD19, so the cells have a preferred high binding affinity towards this. So the cells bind, come, stabilize, and then they form really nice contacts, and then they get, yeah, they, they, you see the calcium flux. Something that you can appreciate already from these videos is that the one with CD19 looks brighter, but the highlighted cells are also some that I have analyzed, and I can show you the analysis. And so what we can completely uh, definitely see is that the total intensity or the absolute intensity of the calcium flux is much lower in the cells which do not have CD19 available, and it's also more erratic. So the cells are just doing an efflux of calcium like they would normally do when they are present in the system. But when CD19 is present, you see that the cells form this landing platform and they generate a massive calcium flux. So there's a lot of calcium being released because the cell has bound and made a large contact on the bilayer. And then eventually it starts being more periodic and then makes a much higher intensity fluxes of calcium, which are actually very surprisingly similar for all the cells that I've analyzed in these images. So this is already very fascinating to see that the uh, calcium flux has become more organized and then this has probably some uh, influence on the immune signaling that is happening in these cells once they recognize the antigen. Uh, of their uh, of the target so cancer cells. So now we know that the calcium flux is happening as well, which is great. Uh, now we want to see the NFAT translocation and if NFAT is being translocated. So in this, I have done a classic experiment where I activate the T cell receptors. Since we are working with jerked cells, they uh, like endogenously express T cells. Uh, this is at a much higher uh, magnification than what you saw previously. So, and you can also appreciate that most of the NFAT initially is present in the cytoplasm and the nucleus looks rather dark. And then when the cells bind to the bilayer, which has T cell uh, receptor antigens, then the nucleus gets more and more bright. With, look at, uh, for example, in this one, most of the NFAT is already translocated into the nucleus of the cells. But it looks very different for CAR T cells, which will get activated with CD19. So for example, uh, if you look at these cells, uh, the nucleus is dark, but also towards the end of the video, there's no new NFAT translocation happening. So this is really something that is very uh, exciting to know because NFAT is the known nuclear factor for T cell activation. And if CARs were believed to act just like T cell receptors, then this should definitely have happened. And this difference is already quite fascinating in itself. So now we know that the, although there is calcium flux happening and a lot of it, NFAT is not getting translocated. So then it points in a direction that maybe there are other transcription factors that are being involved and the gene transcription is being regulated in a very different way. And maybe that is what makes CARs more potent than T cell receptors at recognizing these antigens and moving on. So to do that, uh, at the moment, I'm very interested in seeing the NF-kappa-B activation because this is another pro prominent immune transcription factor. And so I'm developing a reporter assay in the lab 
to understand the NF-kappa B pathway that is involved. And what this uh, reporter assay also helps us with is to compare the differences between NFAT and NF-kappa B. Since we do most of our microscopy experiments with live cells, uh, it's very difficult to do it for prolonged periods of time. And so thus such a reporter assay can actually help us also to do a time resolution over multiple hours if we want to see the NFAT activation at a later point of time. Uh, so, and then to refine more of the experiments, we would also like to do some uh, proper quantification and see how the NFAT translocation and calcium pulse analysis changes with all these, with, especially with the two different cars that I'm working on. And that's not the only thing that I'm interested in. We are also interested in to see if the receptor density on the membrane is going to make a difference. So we have already sorted ourselves for a high and a low expression of the cars, and to see how that would change in its uh, in the in terms of the signaling effects that we see at the moment, and then a prolonged uh, and a more much more distant plan is to again study the receptor organization. Since we do a lot of single molecule microscopy, I assume we can get some really good data on that as well. And with that, I would like to thank. Our team, uh, that's a photo from a group outing that we had on one of the islands in the Netherlands. The PhD candidate who's working on this and uh, has been really, really efficient. And the synthetic adhesion system was a, a thing that she has implemented in this project. All the funding agencies, AMOLF, and also to all of you. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Yes. When you were showing the analysis of the calcium, yeah, you, you mentioned that it was more organized. Uh, yeah. I think I got a little confused there. What, what, what about it is more organized? So as you can see that uh, the first one, the pulses are very erratic. Like they just happen at a very short period of time. Whereas uh, maybe the blue line over here is the best example that I can give you. Is that over here, you can clearly see, although the cells are also landing on a bilayer here, they don't form a nice uh, calcium platform like they do in this cell, for example, that there's a massive calcium efflux that happens and then it goes down. So that means that the cell has like now been bound and now the downstream signaling process has been activated. And so then it has very strong pulses of calcium that are coming up and going down, as you can see here. And this is also something that you see in other cells and it's very repetitive, but also happens at the same time points. So there is some level of rhythm involved at that point, which is not present when there's no antigen that is being presented to these cells. Yeah. Yes. I, I still have to do this. So this is the one with uh, CD28, which is also a co-stimulatory domain that T-cell receptors use. Uh, I have to study the differences with the 41BB as well. And I will definitely be happy to present it next time. Yes. So uh, how are the size of the cells the size? Uh, um, I'm wondering, you're using these bilayers. Bilayers. Yeah. To do the experiment. How does that compare with the actual cell? Yeah, that's an interesting point. Uh, it's it's really difficult to know, but also what is the immune cell is about the same size. So, and its uh, receptor density is going to remain constant if we expose it to a bilayer. So we are expecting that it will make a contact. Maybe it will be a bit smaller since both the cells have a circular surface. So maybe the contact would be much smaller because with a bilayer, the cell is allowed to spread as much as possible. But but I'm expecting that it would still be, since the receptor density is uniform in the cell, that it would still be able to form a certain level of, uh, yeah, big flat surface, which is also something that you see for T cells. T cell receptors have seen it in quite a few papers that they actually do make really large contacts between the immune cells and the cancer cells. Yes. Yes. It was super surprising that we have calcium release and fat is not. Because it's supposed to be a feed through calcium neurons. Exactly. Right? There's lots of days to activate yeah. calcium. So Absolutely. Is calcium in the air? In this, in this? Yes. 
It's definitely there because uh, we do see it for when we activate T cell receptors. So these, this is the exact same cells that I've used in these experiments, except over here, I don't give it CD19. I just give it uh, OKT3, which is, uh, or ionomycin, which just activates the T cell receptor instead of the CARs. Whereas over here, and the bilayer does not have any CD19. So this, they, they're the exact same cells. But in this one, it's almost like within 30 minutes, almost all end fat is translocated into the nucleus. Whereas for CAR cells, when they are exposed to CD19, we hardly see any end fat translocation. So that's another reason why I want to develop this reporter assay, because since we're doing live cell imaging here, it's very difficult to go, for example, beyond an hour. But maybe the end fat translocation is just really slow because of the organized calcium pulses and that it just takes much longer for NFAT to go into the nucleus. So with the reporter, I say I can actually do a time lapse and check maybe at two hours and then at 18 hours and see if there's a pattern. And it could also be that the NF kappa B and NFAT are getting synchronized and then one goes in first and the other one goes in later. So all of that needs to be explored. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, hi everyone. I would like to start by thanking the organizers for giving me the great opportunity uh, for coming from so far away and presenting my work. I'm very excited and uh, very grateful to be able to talk to you about what I did during my PhD student, um, PhD, sorry, during, uh, in the lab of Eric van Nimblegen in, um, in Basel. I, um, in this work, I studied actually the response of E. coli to starvation uh, in terms of gene expression at yeah. the single cell level. What happens when we put bacteria in a flask of fresh nutrient? Well, it's been well established that bacteria will start consuming these nutrients and the number that is represented on the Y axis here will grow exponentially. Once bacteria have exhausted one of the nutrients that is required for growth, their number will stagnate and they will enter the so-called stationary phase. And if they're left long enough in this state, they will start dying. Now, most of our quantitative understanding of bacterial gene expression is coming from exponential phase. Um, the way gene regulatory networks are functioning, the way phenotypes are set, all of that is coming from exponential growing cells. And one of the reasons for that is arguably that in this phase, it's possible to put bacteria in a reproducible steady state. But if you think of it in the wild, nutrients are limited and there are many bacteria competing for them. So it's actually gonna happen extremely often that bacteria are lacking the nutrients required for growing and will be in a state of uh, non-growth. Non and the stationary phase is in the lab a study case for uh, such non growing states. Now, because the number is stagnate, because the energy is running low, because they start dying, um, one would wonder whether bacteria can do anything at all in starvation. It would actually be quite intuitive to think they are simply in a dormant state waiting for new nutrients to come in order to regrow. Well, it's actually been shown in 2014 that uh, by Giffen and colleagues that bacteria can keep on expressing genes during starvation. To do that, they seeded fresh nutrients with bacteria, let them grow exponentially until they reach stationary phase. And by following the gene expression, they could see that the production rate was dropping uh, very abruptly upon entering to starvation, as expected. But instead of hitting zero, it was remaining at around 10% of its exponential phase value for an extended period of time, which means bacteria are not necessarily dormant in stationary phase, they are able to keep on expressing G. Still, because growth are rested, the dilution goes down to zero. And production, we've seen, is also going down, which means that the protein turnover goes down with starvation. Concentrations cannot change that much in theory. Yet, it's been broadly reported that exponentially growing cells compared to star cells have very different phenotypes. On the electron microscopy features, you see that morphologically they are very different, but they are also phenotypic traits that are associated with star cells, such as increased tolerance to broad range of stresses that are completely absent in exponentially growing ones, which means the phenotypes change a lot in starvation. So there is a conundrum that we need to solve here, how to achieve deep phenotypical changes while we cannot turn over protein so much. In other words, how is protein concentration set during starvation? That's the question we want to answer. In E. coli, the transcription initiation will start when a sigma factor, that is a specific transcription factor and also a subunit of the RNA polymerase, is binding to a promoter, and that allows the RNA polymerase to start transcribing the gene. In E. coli, there are several flavors of these transcription factors, the sigma factors, and they are all in the tug of war to access the RNA core polymerase. 
And it's important to realize that all of those same factors are responsible for controlling many genes that are typically responsible for different functions. For example, our POD is typically associated with the expression of growth and housekeeping genes, whereas RPOH is typically associated with a heat shock and protein aggregation response. And RPOS, particularly important today, is associated with stress and starvation response. There are many others, but today I will tell you only about these ones in particular. Now we want to understand what happens to uh, the temporal dynamic of gene um, expression in, star in starvation. So we need to follow different genes having different uh, regulatory dynamics. And to do that, we use a um, transcriptional reporter where a promoter of interest is driving the expression of a fluorescent protein such that by following the fluorescence that is emitted by the cells, we are able to track the expression of this promoter. Now we want to follow individual cells because starvation is typically known to be associated or thought to be associated with increased heterogeneity. And we want to do that a long time with high time resolution and with environmental control because we want to be able to switch cells from exponential growth to starvation. And one of the best suited tools to do that is called is a microfluidic device called the mother machine in which individual bacteria that you can see as those black rods here are trapped into dead end channel and put in contact with a media of interest by the experimentalist through the main channel that is flowing here. And in our experiments, we typically switch the cells using a pressure controller from a media containing glucose where they can grow exponentially to a media that contains no carbon source where they will be starved for carbon. We actually see that the growth RS is pretty much instantaneous when we switch them to carbon free media. Now, using time lapse fluorescent microscopy, we are able to acquire with high time resolution images that will inform us about the morphology of the cell, but also about the uh, level of expression of the promoter of interest using the fluorescence media. Our lab is putting great effort into extracting quantitative measurements out of these uh, images. And the first step of my analysis consists in using a software called MOMA that is allowing us to recover for every individual cells at every individual time point, information about their lineages and information about their lengths and fluorescence. On these plots, you see an example of individual cell traces for fluorescence. Ideally, we would like to get from this um, instantaneous rate of growth because this indicates us about the general physiological state of the cell. And also we want to see when cells are growth arrested and also in the uh, instantaneous rate of volumic production. That is basically how the activity of the promoter, how much protein, fluorescent protein is produced per unit volume per unit time, uh, taking into account the fact that we have effects such as photo bleaching and degradation. But despite very careful measurements in these individual cells, the uh, measurement noise is typically high compared to the biological fluctuation that we are uh, having in our system. So doing instantaneous derivative on those traces just doesn't work because it yields too noisy results. Therefore, we use a Bayesian inference uh, procedure that is implemented within a software that we are developing that is called real trace. And that is allowing us for fluorescence and length to get the best estimate of what is the noise free uh, value of this uh, variable, along with a reliable estimation for the growth rate and the volumic production rate. So with this, we are able to track individual cells gene expression a long time as we switch them from exponential growth to starvation. So I can come back to the question we want to answer, how is protein concentration set during starvation? We primarily follow the production rate because it translates the activity of the promoter we're interested in. And out of the 20 promoters I studied in my PhD, I will show you today three that are covering the spectrum of behavior we observe across all the promoters we study. And they are typically um, uh, controlled by the three sigma factor I was talking to you earlier. The first one is called BOA, and it's basically uh, controlled by sigma F, that is the stress response uh, transcription factor. And so we expect to see the most changes for those kind of promoters. And indeed, we see that in average, the volumic production rate is peaking very sharply at time zero that corresponds to the entry into starvation. It then decays exponentially towards zero. And here I'm showing you only 20 hours, but we typically run 60 hours of starvation. But what we found is that actually most of the activity changes are happening very early on in starvation. And that's why I'm showing you only 20 hours. You see with the ribbon that corresponds to the standard deviation across the population that cells behave remarkably homogeneously. And I will come back to that later, but we will focus on the average behavior for now. 
So on the other end of the spectrum, we have promoter stress RPLN, that is a ribosomal promoter controlled by sigma B. And for these promoters, we see that at time zero, the production activity is basically sharply going down to zero. So they stop expressing very abruptly. And in the middle, we have promoters such as HSLD that is controlled by RPOH, so a heat shock response promoter. And for those, we don't see a significant dip nor a significant peak of activity at the entry into starvation. Rather, they simply peter out exponentially from the level they had during exponential phase. But now we are interested in understanding the concentration temporal dynamic because this is what sets the phenotypes of the cell. And concentration itself is a product of the production on the one hand and dilution and degradation on the other hand. Dilution, we know in our experiment, is pretty much dropping to zero instantaneously. And degradation, I won't have the time to enter into details today, but we are able to measure experimentally for our fluorescent uh, reporter. And so this will be the same for all the promoters we are studying in this case. So to understand the differences in temporal dynamics of concentrations for our different promoters, we just need to understand how production is affecting uh, the concentration. We developed a very simple mathematical model that is basically saying what would be the expected concentration if the production function was uh, basically essentially what we observe at the entry into starvation and a simplified version of that. So in the easiest case that corresponds more or less to our sigma D promoter, production is arresting instantaneously at the same time as the dilution upon entry into starvation. In this case, we expect the relative concentration to go down because of the degradation effect. But interestingly, if we now simply introduce a gradual decrease, a bit like what we've seen for our sigma H promoter, we see that the shift between this production that lingers on while the dilution already arrested is allowing the cell to produce a, a burst of concentration. And the level of the concentration that will be reached finally is dependent on the rate at which the production is decaying upon entry into starvation. Finally, if we introduce a peak like we've seen for our sigma S promoter already, we modulate further the expected concentration. And so here it's important to realize that even though the arrest of dilution that is coming from the arrest of growth is preventing the cells from having this fast turnover of protein, it's also an opportunity for the cell to increase the uh, concentration of certain gene products even in the absence of an increased production. So it's actually an opportunity that the cell can use to change the concentration of gene products. And indeed, when we come back to our experimental results now, if we integrate our production uh, rates along time with the degradation that we measured, we can see that the normalized concentration is following the patterns that we expected. So this is telling us that most of the changes in concentration are actually uh, coming from this shift between gross arrest and dilution arrest. And that's my first result. In exponential growth, both growth and production are at a certain level that sets the concentration of the gene product we're interested in. In early starvation, the growth goes down to zero, but the production remains at a certain level, which allows the cells to do a burst of concentration. And late in starvation, both growth and production are down and the concentration remains stable. Now, stationary phase is associated with increased heterogeneity of the cells. And so we wanted to see whether we see a signature of this increased heterogeneity in our data. So we check individual cell traces of concentration. Uh, here you get a random sample of them for each promoters. And what we see is that rather the contrary, actually. In exponential phase, the cells seem to follow a much more independent track than uh, early in stationary phase, especially for our two promoters which concentration is increasing, where we see that individual cells seem to respond very homogeneously to starvation and all at the same time. We can actually quantify that by asking how much information do we get on individual cell temporal dynamic by looking at the average across the population? On this cartoon, you can see that if all cells behave independently, this value will be low. We get very few information on individual cells by looking at the average behavior. But if all cells behave exactly the same, this value will be very high because by looking at the average behavior, we get a precise idea of what individual cells are doing. Now we can look at what is this value in growth. And we can see that the fraction of explained variance is actually very low for our three promoters, which means cells tend to behave rather independently in this uh, state. But now when we look at the first 10 hours of starvation, where we see most of the changes of concentration, 
we see now that the uh, fraction of explained variance is systematically higher and can go up to more than 60%, which means cells behave very homogeneously at the entry into starvation. Finally, we can look at the remaining 50 hours of starvation, and we see that cells start behaving independently again. And this is my second result, that individual cells respond remarkably homogeneously to starvation, both in terms of timing and in terms of amplitude, which really suggests that the gross arrest might act as a signal to trigger a regulation program inside the cell that is based on the arrest of dilution. Now, we've mostly focused on the entry dynamics into starvation, but of course we know that there is some remaining activity. And one question that arises is, after 60 hours, what fraction of the phenotype is set by the early event of production versus what has happened later on? And so what we can do to, uh, to answer this question is ask at any time point during starvation, what fraction of the protein that are present in the cells are coming from different uh, production periods, gross, early starvation, late starvation. On those plots, you will already see that the um, red fraction always start at 100%. At time zero, when cells enter starvation, everything they have in their cytoplasm has been iterated from what they were doing when they were growing. For 10 hours, the blue sectors will be able to increase because that's how we define early starvation. And for the remaining 50 hours, the green sectors can increase. For ribosomal promoter, unsurprisingly, the red sector dominates throughout the entirety of starvation. And this is because production stops instantaneously at the entry. Therefore, all the proteins that are in the cells have been inherited from the growth phase. But interestingly, when we look at the two promoter whose concentration is increasing upon entry into starvation, we see now that the blue sector is expanding very rapidly. So that means that the cells are forgetting the state they were in during exponential growth very rapidly. And remarkably, after 60 hours, especially for our stress response promoter, most of the protein that are in the cell are still the ones that were produced very early on during starvation. And so this is my third result. The fact that the phenotypes are set early on during starvation, as soon as the cells switch, they set their phenotype and then are kept kept for a very long time. So the cells are stuck in the phenotype they were managed to produce. But one can wonder, well, does that matter at all, right? Um, and our hypothesis is that if all the phenotypes are set early on in starvation, phenotypes that are relevant for bacterial fitness should also be set early on during starvation. So for example, the increased tolerance to stress that is associated with starvation should be set early on, and we should be able to see that by perturbing gene expression at different time points in starvation. So what we did is we switched the cells from M9 glucose, where they grow exponentially, to M9 zero, where they are starved for carbon, just as we did up till now, except that after 20 hours, we exposed them to five hours of oxidative stress. After that, we put them back into fresh media, and we asked what fraction of the cell is able to regrow that will indicate us about the viability of the cell. On those experiments, we will follow the concentration of our sigma S reporter, because our hypothesis is that this is indicative of how well the cells were able to adapt their phenotype. And um, in the absence of perturbation, as we've seen up till now, the concentration is increasing rapidly very early on, then remain constant until the moment of the stress. And when we ask what fraction is able to survive, we see that if the cells are left to express their genes freely, they are perfectly able to cope with this stress. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, we can use a negative control that is RPS not out strain, where the cells will not be able to do the stress and starvation response. And we expect that they are suffering a lot from this stress that we impose on them. When we look at the concentration of our stress response reporter, we see that indeed they are not able to upregulate the uh, stress response. And asking what fraction is able to survive, we see that a uh, very low fraction is able to survive. So doing the stress response is important for surviving stress. So far, nothing very uh, surprising. Is it also, is, it, is there zero death before the... Um... Yes, actually, I can. Uh, we did some control experiments where we don't submit them to uh, an oxidative stress, and they're all able to survive even in the RPS not out background. But you can already see that, that in exponential growth, the concentrations are already different from those two strains. So that means that cells already enter starvation with a different phenotype, and we are actually interested in gene expression during starvation. So what we wanted to do is actually start inhibiting now gene only when cells start entering starvation. And for that, we use a, an antibiotic called chlorophenicol that prevents cells from translating proteins. 
and then we leave them inhibited for the entirety of starvation, including the stress. When we do that, we see that at this concentration of chlorothelical, we don't reach a perfect inhibition, but we still see that the concentration is uh, dramatically reduced. And asking what fraction is able to regrow, we see that we lose 80% of viability compared to the absence of perturbation. So expressing gene during starvation is fundamental for this phenotype of increased tolerance to stress. But our hypothesis is actually that most of the phenotype is set early on during starvation, right? So we can ask now, what happens if we leave the cell express free the gene for five hours and then inhibit gene expression? If our hypothesis is correct, they should be able to recover a substantial fraction of viability because they would be able to adapt their phenotype very early on. When we do that and we check the stress response reporter concentration, we see that as expected, the concentration reaches very similar level to what is happening in the absence of perturbation. And asking what fraction is able to regrow, we see that we recover 50% of viability compared to inhibiting genes during the uh, entirety of starvation. That means that by leaving cells expressed for five hours freely, we are already able to almost reach the viability that is in the absence of perturbation. So cells are able to adapt their phenotype very quickly um, uh, upon entry into starvation. And this is my last result. Early gene expression has functional implications on relevant traits associated with starvation. In exponential growth, the cells are well equipped for whatever challenges they are facing in this phase. But in early starvation, they are already changing the phenotype very quickly to be able to deal with whatever will come. And late starvation only uh, um, liminally changes the phenotype. With this, I would like to uh, conclude by reminding you our main results. The first one is that most of the changes in concentration are happening at the onset of starvation and they really result from the shift between the moment the growth is arresting and the moment the production is completely arresting, which allows the cells to actually use the absence of dilution to change their phenotype. Individual cells respond very homogeneously, both in terms of timing and in terms of amplitude, which signs some programmed response to starvation. Phenotypes are therefore set very early on during starvation and are long lasting. The cells change their phenotype and then they are stuck in whatever the state they were managing to reach within the first five to 10 hours. And all of that has functional implications on relevant traits. With this, I would like to thank uh, the members of the NIMPEGAN group and particularly the people that have been directly implicated in this uh, project. So Thomas that um, uh, supervised my PhD, Eric that co-supervised me and is the PI of the lab, Bjorn and Michel um, are responsible for the softwares that I talked about early on, and they will help me uh, for a part of the stress uh, experiments during the NFG. I would also like to thank you for your attention, and I'm uh, ready to take any questions. Yes. So I, I, I want to say that in the old days, they, they, um, looked at sigma factor fluctuations during exponential growth and there was fluctuations uh -huh. uh, which would be consistent with the exponential growth part of this but i guess your data suggests that the starvation filters that sigma those sigma factor fluctuations out such that they don't really matter at least in this experiment is that correct so actually yeah there are many mechanisms that are reported in starvation that is basically allowing this uh, tug of war to become favorable for sigma s and other sigma factors so sigma s concentration is increasing very rapidly upon entry into starvation and you also have anti sigma sigma factors that are sort of basically sequestering sigma 70 that is its main competitor and sort of allowing basically sigma s to take over and be responsible for most of the expression so it's really a way for the cell to sort of suddenly switch from one regulatory program to another where they express a whole different bunch of genes i mean i guess the, i think i understood I, I understood that the 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 way it was framed in when you know during those old, older studies uh -huh. was that like if you have a you know the fraction of cells that have like a high sigma s expression are like ready for starvation or ah, i see like, it turns out that everyone's ready for starvation because you express sigma sigma s during yes starvation. that's our our result is actually suggesting exactly that sort of the the variability across cells in terms of the expression of these reporters for different sigma factors is uh, decreasing upon entry into starvation so it goes exactly in this direction of saying whatever variability was around during exponential growth is erased and all cells are sort of set uh, to the same state uh, 
at that moment. Yes. I think I understand. So in, in item two, where you see this very nice uh, tight response with many cells. Yeah. Immediately after. I think I understand that. I understand the point you're making. I'm a little confused by this measure of variance, fraction of variance explained and so on. Ah, uh, yes. And, and part of my concern is that if I take a dynamical system and it's a little bit noisy, and you know, I take many copies of it and they're kind of wandering around. And then I hit them all at the same time. Yes. The trajectories tend to collapse, right? And then if I don't hit it again, they'll eventually diffuse away from each other. Yes. So is that what's going? Is that all that's going on? I mean, that's important, but but in some way, it's not a special mechanism, right? It's, I, I guess that's what is going on. But what is remarkable is that if you do other kind of switches, for example, if you were to take the cells growing in glucose and switch them to lactose the response will be much more sort of there would be temporal differences between the cells as well as sort of expression differences so it's like in terms of these biological switches it's actually quite rare to observe this uh, very uh, sharp response and this is probably due to the um, nature of the stress we are imposing on them the fact that dilution is stopping and so this is sort of like hard to avoid and there is few space for variability but it's interesting to think that maybe evolution has precisely harnessed this uh, effect to provide uh, a very coherent response to starvation. Because then what's remarkable is that the fact that you have these sort of uh, decreasing uh, activities that are, are more or less the same rate is sort of basically allowing all the cells to get the same final concentration once the dilution stops. Would it make sense to then switch out of starvation? And see if the if that also produces something more real reproducible. Yeah, that would be interesting actually. Uh, well, basically, what I can say is that the 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 lag time, so how much time uh, how much time cells need to start regrowing, is already quite widely spread. You have some cells that wake up very early and some cells that wake up quite late. So I kind of already know the answer that it will probably not sort of be as uh, homogeneous once you exit starvation. So there is something special about this. There is something special about this. That's why we are well, like basically we do a lot of these environmental switches in the lab, and it's rarely that we observe such a coherent response, even though we sort of always hit them at a very precise time with a specific stress or st specific perturbation. Thanks. Hey, that was very interesting. Um, I mean, from the point of view of E. coli, there are different types of starvation, mm -hmm. and I may have missed what you're doing, but you can imagine that. I started them for nitrogen, but I still have a carbon and energy source, or I started them for phosphate, and I have both carbon. And nitrogen. I'm curious if you have thoughts on that. Absolutely. So, like, this is, uh, you're right, I didn't uh, emphasize that enough. This is carbon starvation, and we actually expect things to be quite different for, say, nitrogen starvation. Because here, we basically uh, remove their energy source, but they still have nitrogen around, right? So, there are, there is a very important phenomena in the cell that is they are able to degrade um, some proteins. But in carbon, this protein degradation is ATP demanding. And so in carbon starvation, they lack ATP, but they have plenty of nitrogen. So they're not doing so much of protein degradation. And basically, they are sort of mostly facing this problem of energy. In nitrogen starvation, on the other hand, they have as much energy as they want, but they have very few nitrogen. So they will degrade protein and recycle much more of their internal components. So there is already definitely a difference there. And I suspect that for phosphate, there are also like, so definitely um, the strategies uh, are certainly different between different kinds of starvation. It would be actually quite interesting to see what, how this system is behaving uh, in different my understanding is like once the MR or once the RNA is um, uh, transcribed, it, uh, it can be translated many times. And I was just wondering what is the lifetime of an RNA relative to the lifetime of you know any of the time scales of the transition? So it's typically short, but we also know that transcription is a uh, sort of relative to translation is not not a very energy consuming process. And actually, there are studies that have shown that sort of uh, doing RNA seq on starved bacteria. You can see that RPOS is constantly high in terms of RNA for a very long time, but we see that our ball A, that is a reporter of RPOS, is going down. And so basically the response we observe is a mixture of this transcriptional upregulation when cells still have the ability to translate uh, protein. So this peak, 
And we attribute this exponential decay of the production rate to sort of the depletion of the energy through the process of translation itself. It's actually quite funny when we use chloramphenicol for five hours, for example, and we remove it, the cells are able to shoot up whereas they already spent five hours in starvation to the same level as they would have if we had not done the, the inhibition, which really means that they keep these internal resources because they are not translating, so they keep the ATP. And when we remove chlorophenicol, they consume all the ATP that is still there and they produce the same responsibility. Yes. Uh, so you're starving them for about 20 hours or- So actually 60, yes. Yes, so what percentage of cells remain in your stationary phase because I'm assuming most of them depend on dying. Actually, no. In our experiments, for 60 hours, they are able to survive it perfectly fine. Uh, so that's quite remarkable. But yes, from, uh, so basically in the literature, there are sort of diverging um, uh, pieces of evidence of how fast cells are dying and so on. So I can't really give you a very clear answer why. We know that different strains have different sort of um, um, version of the RPOS response. And that obviously plays a big role in their ability to survive and so on. So, um, but in our experiments, this duration, they are able to deal with just fine. I guess they're in really happy conditions other than the carpet, right? Yes. So, yeah, it's a buffered uh, and everything is flushed by. So like any sort of uh, waste product that would be toxic for them is also like uh, flushed away. Um, also, like I have to say, we can't exclude that we don't have micro traces of carbon that are not able sort of not enough to for them to grow because we would see that but we we are blind to sort of them being able to have a very small quantity of things that are allowing them to maintain uh, uh thanks for the, for that question and the follow-up with that so after 60 hours if you gave them food again you gave them carbon would they go to exactly the same variability that you had before so it will take a while and sort of basically this, uh, how fast they recover is set by sort of the, the growth rate, right? Because they start diluting whatever waste they had and so on. And uh, they reach a steady state. What we know is that like, if we switch from, uh, if we let them 30 hours in starvation and then switch them, they recover pretty quickly. But if we let them 60 hours in starvation and then switch them back to fresh media, they are much more spread and their lag time is typically longer. So one thing that we were wondering, for example, is, is it, does it take longer for the first cell to start dividing compared to its um, progeny and things like that? But so I, we didn't go into um, uh, too much um, in, too much in depth in this problem. Sorry. Oh, so yeah, I eventually they will reach the same level. Yeah, they will dilute and reach the same steady state and sort of like the, like you could switch them back to starvation and would probably do the same again. I mean, it's obviously it would be interesting to see sort of how quickly you need to switch and like do cycles and stuff like that. And, Thank you. Thank you. So thanks for the introduction. Hi, everybody. My name is Dan. I'm a fourth year grad student at MIT. And today I'm really excited to tell you about some theory work in this field of microbial ecology that I think is so exciting. And this work was developed in collaboration with Yun, Maron, and, uh, and Kirill. So the big question that we're interested in answering is what changes about ecological competition in space? I think we have, you know, maybe some intuition about the well-mixed case. And here, when I say well-mixed, what I mean is you take your microbes, you put them in a test tube, and you continuously shake. And here, you know, there's a lot of very deep, interesting theory, but maybe the simplest case is the two microbes have different growth rates. And you expect, you put them in the tube and you shake, and after some amount of time, the one with the higher growth rate is gonna sort of dominate. Now, in space, the classes of behaviors that you can get are much richer. There's all of the spatial patterning. There's um, a spatial colonization process as the microbes spread across the dish. And it's not obvious when you look at pictures like this, how the geometry and the growth all along the plate is feeding back onto the competition. So to set our, you know, our thinking, let's start with a very simple example where you go to the dirt and you collect some microbes, and maybe you collect a wild type, that we're gonna color it red, and some sort of mutant, we're gonna color it blue. And then what you do is you go to a Petri dish, and in each Petri dish, you inoculate a little bit of this microbe and you allow them to grow, and they form some big colony. Now, in this case, the red forms a very big colony because it's a fast grower, 
and the blue forms a smaller colony because it's a slow grower. And these microbes don't swim or crawl. All they're doing is dividing. And the, each layer is being successfully populated by those in the previous generation. Now, just take a minute and think, what do you think is going to happen when you take these two, you mix them together first, and you inoculate the mixture on a petri dish? Just take like five seconds and think about it. And you know, once you've built some intuition, um, OK. So when you mix them and you put them on the dish, something I think is very surprising happens. You mix them with red and blue in this dotted circle here, and you let them grow. And what you see is the blue, the slow expander, has somehow colonized the edge of the front. And this is good for the blue. Because as, as the growth proceeds, it's only these individuals at the leading edge that'll have access to things like nutrients and more space to divide into. And so in some sense, the blue has really won this competition, breaking our intuition that maybe the faster grower has some advantage. You can do the same experiment at a lower density. So it's a very similar setup. You just decrease the total number of cells you inoculate with. And you see this very interesting spatial pattern start to emerge. There are these sectors that are very well defined and very reproducible. And what you see is that these sectors establish at different points along the expanding front. And as the growth proceeds, they get wider over time. And then eventually, these sectors meet one another and sort of pinch off where the red had the opportunity to grow. And maybe the conclusion here is that the competitive fitness in space is certainly not the same thing as the growth rate. And these sectors give us a nice assay or some sort of way to think about competition. Because if you see a sector and you see that it's getting wider, then you probably expect that at some point in the future, that sector is going to take over the expanding breadth. What's the mutation? Hmm? What's the mutation? Oh, I have no idea. It, it, we, this is something we're trying to figure out, but I don't know. Um, oh, it's, it actually is a wild type. Oh, They're both wild type. Yeah. Well, no, you, uh, crazy, you grow the red one, and this blue one will arise naturally. It, it, it evolves. So it's, which is something I, I don't have a good explanation for. Hi, I'm on So Zoom. we're talking about these sectors, and it turns out these sectors are pretty generic. You can even observe them in the case where there's no competition. So it's sort of just neutral expansion. Here, these are two strains of E. coli that um, are just different colors, and you inoculate a mixture, and they quickly split into these sectors. And this is just due to strong demographic fluctuations of the expanding front. You can also do this for uh, a linear inoculation, where you put the microbes on a razor blade and you dip it on the agar. And um, you can also inoculate on a line. And this is really the case we're going to focus on. So the big question here now is, can we predict fitness in space? That is, I give you a fast expander. I give you a slow expander. And what do you expect to happen generically when you compete these things against each other? The most common case is the fast one will win. And this is what's shown here. Uh, you have a sector of some sort of black microbe that is expanding very quickly. And the sector is getting wider with time. But then there are also cases where the slow one wins. And we would like a theory that can sort of combine all of these things together. So the first simplifying assumption we're going to make is that colony growth is really just driven by the leading edge. So what I mean is if you look at some sort of you know, cartoony sector, it's only the individuals that are along the expansion front that are going to contribute to the colony growth. This is due to a couple of reasons. But maybe the one I'll focus on here is just nutrient availability. The individuals at the front are the only ones that have um, the ability to access these nutrients that are diffusing in from new territory. And when you try to write down a model for the growth of some sort of front, you sort of naturally come on a KPZ equation. And the terms here have a pretty uh, natural interpretation. The first one saying that the front has some velocity, call it V. Uh, the second term says that when you tilt the front a little bit, the velocity vector will tilt to stay perpendicular to the front. The last term here is some sort of diffusion. It's more phenomenological. It's due to things like surface rearrangements and also can be explained by mechanical pressures propagating throughout the colony. Now, to model competition along the front, we use something like a Fisher equation. And the idea is if you look at a point on the front, you ask the question, what's the fraction of mutant at that location along the front? So here, say the mutant fraction is 0, so you would plot f equals 0. On this purple bit, the fraction is close to 1, so you'd plot a 1. And then when, over here, it's 0, and so you plot a 0. And then to get the dynamics of f, we assume that it composes composed of two pieces. There's a logistic growth, which just says that the mutant has some sort of intrinsic local fitness advantage that causes it to increase its frequency over time. 
and a diffusion. This diffusion here comes from the fact that when the bacteria divide, there's a little bit of uncertainty on where their progeny are going to end up on this, on this agar plate. And this uncertainty sort of accumulates into something that might look like a diffusion at a larger length scale. And this equation is known to generate some sort of traveling wave solutions with a speed. So there's some speed here, u, and this is the speed at which the sector, we would maybe expect for it to get wider with time. So it's a measure of the selection pressure. We, um, so I introduced this equation for the shape of the colony. And what we did is we added a term that essentially makes the velocity frequency dependent. So this means that if this alpha were a positive number, then regions that are occupied by the mutant will grow, the front will grow faster. And if alpha were a negative number, then regions that are occupied by the mutant would grow a little bit slower. Um, the final thing we put in the model is this observation that if you take a sector and you tilt your petri dish a little bit, you would see the same sector, but it would seem to drift in the direction you tilt it, right? Here, the sector seems to be drifting to the right. And this is really just due to the fact that it, there's some sort of passive uh, advection in the direction of the slope. And so that, that's what this term is. You can see it as an advection velocity that depends on the slope of the front. OK, so you put all these ingredients together, and you can solve either on the computer or by hand in some cases. And what you see is that you can find these traveling wave solutions where the invasion velocity u, that's the speed at which the sector boundary moves to the right and to the left, is some emergent thing. It depends on growth rates. It depends on local competitive viability. But it's not something that you can prescribe by hand. So the first thing we did is we put this on the computer and we just solved it. So the setup is you have some sort of mutant strain with a growth rate that's V0 plus some alpha. You have a wild type strain with some growth rate V0. And then what we did is we changed this alpha. So that's what's changing along the horizontal. And we measured the speed of invasion. So we measured the speed of the resulting fissure wave. And what you see are two regions. There's one region where changing the expansion speed doesn't seem to do anything. And then there's a region where it seems to matter quite a lot. And you won't be too surprised maybe to hear that this number here, it's two, right? This number at which the velocity sort of saturates is the Fisher speed. So there's some region in parameter space where it's only the local competition. It's only these Fisher dynamics that give rise to the traveling waves. You could do the same sort of numerical test for a couple of different values of the selection coefficient. So different strengths of local selection, and you see different plateau values. So you see different values of the Fisher speed that's to be expected. But there's some sort of universal behavior where no matter what selection coefficient you pick, at some large growth rate difference, so when this mutant is very fast at colonizing new territory, you see the same behavior across different simulations. Uh, this is actually to be expected from like a geometric picture. So if you assume that maybe the morphology is something like a circular arc, you can draw a right triangle, you can apply the Pythagorean theorem and solve for this u, and you get a u that depends on the square root of alpha, the square root of the growth rate difference, but nothing else. So we've plotted that in purple here, and you see that it describes the data very well. So there's this region where the, uh, the local Fisher dynamics are dominating. And then there's this region where the sort of Pythagorean theorem kicks in, and all you get is this universal behavior. Okay. Now, if you plot the result, the morphology, so what the sectors would be expected to look like, you see there's this V-shaped dent, which was characteristic of a slow expander wing. There's some sort of intermediate morphology that we've been calling a composite morphology, and it's yet to be observed experimentally, as far as I'm aware. And then you get the circular arc speed, which and again, with this sort of purple dashed line. Okay. So this behavior was kind of strange, and we wanted to see whether this was generic. So what we did was we went back to our equations. We went back to this Fisher equation with the dynamics, and we added some sort of frequency dependency to the, to the selection. And here, we picked one that was uh, exactly solvable in the absence of all the coupling so that we could start to think about this really quantitatively. And for those of you who have thought about traveling waves in the past, this is sort of the difference between a pulled wave and a pushed wave. So um, here I'm showing, this is the plot I just showed you on the left. This is just for comparison. And here's the same, here's the same type of plot but for this uh, frequency dependent selection. So when you compare them side by side, you should see how different this behavior is. First of all, you see that there's some region where the invasion velocity is negative. And then you also see uh, a non-constant you know, non dependency for intermediate values of the expansion speed difference. So the first thing I'll point out 
is that if you plot the speed of the circular arc, so that's what this purple dashed line was here on the left that we saw previously. If you plot that again, you see that at large expansion speed differences, we can again we can describe the results. If you plot the uh, circular arc speed, but just going in the other direction, that's what describes this negative region down here. So that if you actually look at the morphologies, you have a fitter mutant in blue and a fast growing wild type in black. And it's actually being invaded. The mutant is being invaded by the wild type despite having some sort of local fitness advantage, which was impossible here, but it happens for a push wave. And if you look at the sector morphologies, what you would see is basically you have this mutant sector that quickly gets crushed by its slow expansion speed. Now, that's just the, any biological intuition about the F minus, the frequency dependent. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, so what would, what would be like a. So you could think of this as a couple of one, you could say that there's some critical frequency, right? So this just says if the mutant is locally at very low frequencies, it might get it, it might be driven extinct. But then if it's able to rise to high enough frequencies, cross some threshold here, that threshold is F0 then maybe through collective effects, it could start to grow. So they're like happier together. Right. Happier together. In, in a different context, uh, similar equations are called like alley effects, where you have some sort of cooperative behavior. This isn't exactly that, because we're dealing with frequencies and not population sizes, but it's a similar idea. Um, another thing you could think of, uh, noise might have a similar effect, where noise, demographic noise, tends to drive things that are in low abundance extinct. And this, you know. But it, it might, you would probably model that different. Reason, yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah, but we, I, we suspect that there are some qualitative similarities here. Now, so we've explained the data for this expansion speed difference when it's very large or very large and negative. And there's this intermediate regime where the expansion speed difference is small. And because we have a small parameter, namely this alpha, we can start to do some perturbation theory. And the result of the per perturbation theory is shown as the purple uh, dashed curve. And what's interesting about this is that if you just follow the pertur perturbative result back, there's some value of this expansion speed difference. It's some negative number, maybe 0.1, minus 0.1, where you expect a reversal of the wave. So this sort of answers the question of how slow is too slow. There's some expansion speed difference where despite your local competitive advantage, you might just not be expanding fast enough into new territory to keep up with the wave front, and then you get driven extinct. And that's what this is telling us. OK, so this is all well and good, but I think um, there's a more traditional approach to thinking about systems like this, which is what about a mechanistic model? So perhaps you look uh, at these results and you say, okay, maybe I have a fast expander, I have a slow expander, and maybe I could specify some interactions between these two. This is more schematic. I don't want you to think too hard about what these numbers might mean, but just say that there's some effect of the fast on the slow and the effect of the slow on the fast. And then what you might do is write down some two-dimensional reaction diffusion model. This is, again, a classic thing that you can do, and it's really effective. But there's some complications. It's two-dimensional, so maybe it's a little expensive to evaluate. And sure, this is a simple model mechanistically. right? You can tell what each term does. But I bet if I gave you the parameters, if I gave you the A's and the growth rates and the things, it would be really hard for you to predict what's going to happen right? when you solve this. The only thing you can really do is put it on the computer. So what we're going to propose is maybe you could find an equivalent model that just keeps track of the frequencies along the front and the shape of the colony itself. And you'll have to find you know, some things here that I, I won't get into how you find them, but you can, you can do it somewhat systematically. And this is nice because we've gone from two-dimensional reaction diffusion, really expensive to evaluate models with limited interpretability to something where you, you, we have some analytic tractability. We can solve this in certain cases, either perturbatively or exactly. And it's probably worth just comparing some numerical results. So on the left is sort of a phase diagram as a function of the interactions uh, of the different competitive outcomes. And you see that there's some region where the slow expander is able to win. And then there are these regions where the fast expander is able to win. And when you plot the morphology, the slow expander wins with some sort of V-shaped dent. And here, the fast expander wins with some sort of circular bulge and with this composite morphology. We can take this equivalent FKPZ model that I just you know, wrote down uh, schematically. And in this top left region, again, with the same A's that we're plotting here, top left region, you get a V-shaped dent. Down here, you get some sort of circular arc speed. And to the bottom right, you get some composite And this isn't, I think, obvious from the model parameters. But when you cast it in terms of this sort of FKPZ framework, it starts to become maybe a little bit more clear. So I'll just tell you a little bit about directions that we think are interesting or promising for the future. One is anisotropic growth. 
So you could imagine specifying growth rules at a more microscopic level, and it's not obvious how those translate up to some sort of coarse grain description. For example, if you have things growing on a lattice, whether or not you allow overhangs is an important uh, rule that you specify microscopically, which can have mi macroscopic effects. And it, it's just, it's not obvious how you would incorporate this in an isotropic growth. Um, the other thing, that, and this is more of a mathematical statement, but there's an equivalent way to formulate this, which is you have your Fisher equation that's being advected by some velocity. And then you have this velocity that's given by some sort of Berger's equation with a pressure given by the frequency. So maybe you could think of some sort of one-dimensional population that's producing some surfactant or something, and differences in concentration gradients of the surfactant can drive flows. And this is sounds like a different problem, but if you've thought about KPZ before, you'll probably know that if you take a derivative of the KPZ equation, you get a Berger's equation. So there's a, a similar, there's a, there's a real connection here. Or this is almost the same equation, set of equations, but in a different context. Um, maybe I'll stop here and just leave some summary slides up. More or less what we've done is discuss how you can incorporate geometry, expansion, and competition into one model that's you know, relatively tractable theoretically and hopefully can gain some insight from that. Uh, we proposed these equations to model the expansion process, uh, you know, keeping some symmetries in mind. We solved the equations numerically and found three morphologies and also specified the invasion behavior as a function of the different competitive strengths. The paper is up here if, you, if you're curious. Um, and I think maybe we can stop for, stop for questions. Curious about um, so you have you have like the invertible tongue, the shallow tongue, and like the full spring tongue. Yeah. Is it just a you know the height of that bump is it continuous or is it you know are these really three distinct cases? Um, um so the height of the bump is continuous. But what changes is, uh, so maybe if you, the shallow cone and the ice cream cone both have some sort of slope of the blue region at the leading edge. But how that slope scales with things like the expansion speed difference changes between these uh, shapes. So there, there is a difference, but you're right. The, the height does kind of go continuously with the parameters. So I think uh, the one term that, you know, is is definitely uh, not true and a lot of sticking out plate is the diffusion term. Um, I can imagine why it would kind of work, you know, but um, as long as you're exploring theory space, you know, like have you thought about incorporating them? Because because they don't they don't move, right? The with respect to each other, except via like growth and rearrangement a little bit. But yeah. So just making sure I understand. You're talking about this. Yeah, that thing? that explains diffusion of cells, basically. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But they don't diffuse. They don't. They don't move. Right. Right. Um. But when they reproduce, unless they, it's deter, it's not quite deterministic where their offspring are. Right. And their offspring, they're getting nudged by each other. They push on one another, and there's a little bit of uncertainty in where the sector, where where everything's going to go relative to where it was. Uh, just as you divide, right? If you divide, it, you, you could have your child here, your child could be here, here, here. It, it's not, I think, obvious from first principles where. Yeah. So, yeah. But I mean, you wouldn't get like a diffusion, you know, if you, yes. like, uh, not even close. So yeah, I, I, I think it might be interesting to explore that, you know, met more mechanistic implement, uh, you know, mm -hmm. implementations of that term, as long as you're kind of mixing and matching stuff or, or building a theory. Um, yeah. Because that seems like it could have functional consequences if you compare the, the data. Yeah, I agree. And I agree with your point that if you leave the front, it's not going to diffuse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that is a very true. Um, I don't really understand how this is happening that the flow of growers um, are on the edges. Like, I would imagine that they would be trapped, some of them would be trapped inside of the like path. Yeah, so when you inoculate, so maybe I'll go back to the very beginning because there's a picture. So when you inoculate these things, um, you inoculate it in a well-mixed scenario. So you take the red and the blue, you stir, and then you inoculate. So there's already going to be some blue sort of at the expanding front. And what, what's been known is that actually pushing forces are really important in this growth process. So the blue um, that are sort of, they get situated at, at the front by luck. 
and then they can get pushed along for quite a long time. This is called gene surfing. They can get pushed just by other cells around them dividing. And so you're right that you might expect them to get swallowed, but that doesn't always happen. And then once they grow to big enough that you can see them, by then it might already be too late. They start, they form the sector. That so just the ones that get killed is the ones that die, right? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you get trapped, you don't have nutrients. Yeah, that was a really good question to talk about. So how could it be that that is sustainable uh, with time? So you have a slow grower at the years and a faster at the start. At some point, I can imagine that the slow grower is going to start getting thinner and thinner, and the fast grower is going to take over. That's something that you observe, and, and maybe I'm wrong. I think what you're saying is exactly why this is so surprising, right? It is like our intuition is it, like this colonization process is in many ways, it's a race, right? To get to new places faster. And yet the blue finds a way to, despite being slower, it evolves to be slower in order to gain some other function, which we, at least I don't, I don't know what it is. So, but it, yeah, no, I, as for, I think that's why it's so surprising. It's at least we're proposing it's because of some local interaction. Yeah. Okay, so technically being slow is not really a disadvantage because humans, if they can still grow in a huge sector, is that right? So it's not really uh, a disadvantage in any way that it grows slower. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because because yeah, it takes over, it wins, right? So like, if we win, why change it? I think maybe the point is, before I showed these slides, if I, you know, when you show, when we took five seconds to think about it, I would have thought, oh, fast one's going to win, no contest, right? And maybe that, but you're, you're right. It's not a, not a fitness disadvantage at all. Uh, yeah. yeah. So um, you mentioned that you create logs, right? You're swallowing. When you start out being all logs, that you can envision to happen in the process that you grow. Yeah. yeah. Yes, that's correct. Then how do you visualize the, the, the two colors? So, so what you do is you, you see that the blue have evolved. You take them, you you tag them so that they're fluoresce, and then you inoculate with a mixture. So in, in wild communities, they do evolve, but these images are not taken from, from communities from the soil. They are, what you do is you isolate them individually and then tag one as red and one as blue. So you have to create the movement first. Yeah, I mean, I didn't create the movement. Right, so, yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. Okay, isn't it surprising that you do no blue cells at all being trapped in any of the sex organ type, they are just completely surprising to me because if they were dying, I would also expect the red guys to die and put some black patches in the middle, but yeah. this is not such a thing. So, and, and my second question, I guess, is are you sure that they are slow growing in the context of the, the co inoculation as compared to the red one? So, I'll answer your first question. So, um, I should have been more honest here. When you inoculate this, if we did a 50 50 mixture it would this would be it, everything would look more like this in order to get this result you have to put 99 percent red and one percent blue so you can't see any blue for most of the experiment because it's just so rare it doesn't it's not bright enough to get picked up by the microscope um now sorry remind me what was your second question uh, uh, like when they are put in competition together oh, yeah. you're sure that there's no like sort of weird uh, inhibitory effect of the blue and the red or something like that it very well could be the case, but I think that would be almost like the definition of local fitness, right? If there's some local advantage in the presence of the other that isn't, I think that would fit very well into what we're talking about with local fitness. But that's a very possible phenotype, phenotype that could that could explain this. Yeah. Then it would sort of redefine fast and slow, right? Like the, yeah. Then it's not so surprising. Like the fast were in this context is still the one winning in this in this frame, so it wouldn't be so conceptually to be different. Like that. It, it could be yes, but uh, right. yeah. Yeah, yeah, very possible. Yeah. Yes. But the test, the, the, the red does outgrow the blue in, in the raw big scenario, right? Um, so actually, I don't know if these experiments have been like, I don't think they've been published. My understanding is no, they don't. In, in, in I think in the well mixed scenario, the blue outcompetes right, the red. Like shaking them. Yeah, if you, if you do the shaken thing, uh, it, it, if I remember correctly. But those. In the initial class, the very first slide, where, where it's. It's like the best brewer is the one that always wins. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's. Oh, oh, for sure it's more complicated. But I think the intuition, you know, we come from, uh, you start by learning about these things in the well mixed scenario, and there the intuition is faster grower equals, fit, equals fitness. And yeah, but you're right. It's, it's more complicated for sure. Okay.
Great. Okay. My next speaker is Carol Rana from the Rose Mice Institute in Fiesta. She's going to talk a little about research. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So the, the presentation before uses uh, sound as a signal to communicate. But here I'm going to talk about when the the thing that you use to communicate is the uh, sense of uh, other. Or we say this problem of, of olfactory research where um, a structure is tasked to find the uh, source of the other. So this is generally, this is generally motivated by how male moths can find female moths in a very large um, range of uh, distance up to the order of hundreds of meters, sometimes even kilometers. Even though the, the information that they usually receive is very intermittent and infrequent because of the mixing of the other or the pheromones that the female moth produces with air. So what you want to do is to try to understand how the searcher, how a searcher agent uh, could be able to use this sparse information to, to locate the source. So as I've said, because of the turbulent transport of these pheromones, the task becomes very difficult. So imagine uh, um, that the information that you receive, like as, as, as you see here, imagine a message um, that is being uh, um, given to you, but you just see letters, but you don't know the whole, whole sentence, which gives you the information of where the, the, the source is. So a lot of approaches have been done also to try to attack this problem. And what we wanted to do here is to see in, uh, in the theoretical point of view, using numerical methods, machine learning techniques, to be able to understand how, how we could uh, formulate a model and how these organisms, for example, process this information. So this is a, a very short review of um, existing techniques of uh, target source localization. So basically, in this kind of problem, it's sort of classified into two different techniques. One that uses a model, model of the environment, model of how the, the, the model of the environment, and, and if you don't have a model at all. So the first, the one on the left, the strategy is to solve an opt optimal strategy um, using a, a map from a belief state to the decision that you make or the action that you, you take. And, but, uh, the challenge here is that you need to have a precise description of your environment to be able to solve it. And at the same time, there is a usually a large memory that is um, that is required to be able to do this task. On the other side, in the model three approach, this is where um, the searcher uses the history of past observations to be able to decide what to do next. And uh, some techniques use neural networks to keep track of these histories. Some also use hardware, I didn't put it here, but uh, some techniques also use hardwired clocks to be able to use this during the search. The challenge here is that we need a large volume of data to be able to learn from the history of past, ev uh, past events or observations to be able to get the decision that we want. So, what do we want to do here? We want to be able to, to propose uh, a method to be able to solve this problem in both cases, model-based and model-free, and addressing also the challenges. So we want to propose an approach where we use a very low dimension memory, or, okay, so we, we call it here finite state controllers or finite memory states. So how do we do this? So we put this problem in a, in a setup of a partially observable markup decision um, process. So there are three different levels here. First is the, the environment, the sensory motor interface and the agent. So three things. First is the, the transition of states is uh, given by this uh, probabilistic model of, uh, it can be deterministic, it can be probabilistic, but in in, in, in what I will show you, we, we use here a probabilistic 
uh, uh, sorry, deterministic model. So it shows you how you transition from one state to the other in one time step, given an action. And then in the measure measuring phase is, is what we call the model of detection. What is the probability of you detecting something in a certain space and at any certain time? And uh, the last one is what we call the policy <clears throat> or our strategy. So this controls, uh, this uh, consists of two things. One is uh, the control of what you do. And second, this is where we added this, uh, what we call memory, or you can also call it as an internal state that an agent has. So aside from doing the action at any certain time, you also um, change your internal state. So this is given by this policy here, um, probability of doing an action and the update given where you are in terms of the memory state and what you observe, which is why. So this is a, if, if, if it, it wasn't clear to you, this is a, one example where you can see here, the colors here would, uh, would mean what kind of uh, memory state you are in. So orange, green, or red. And the X, Y are the positions. So in, in partial observability Markov different processes, the agent does not have access to the st state, the, the positional state that they have. So they don't have access to where exactly they are in the, in the arena. So they will use the observation that they that they receive to um, decide the action that they do. So the main goal here is to find a policy, a strategy that gives the minimum time, minimum search time, which is to, to find where is the source. And uh, this is uh, an, uh, an example of how, how this model of the environment works. There are basically matrices. And if you are in this state, this is the probability, because this is a deterministic uh, model, so we, have, we only see one and zero. If the action is flat and you're here, then the probability to be in this state is one and other um, place is zero. If you want to add noise, um, we can put some some small probabilities uh, around one here. And uh, this is how we device how to how to illustrate our policies. You will see a lot of uh, things like this later. So I, I would have to explain it already at this level. So this means um, this circle here without the any shade, it means there is no signal received. And this one is shaded when a signal is received. So it's like a binary um, observation. There's a threshold. And if it reaches this threshold, then you receive the signal. If not, then no. And then this is an example for two memory state and four options. So let's take one, one example. So this arrow here means that if you are in this memory state and you didn't receive a, a signal, then the probability of doing a, an upward action Okay, is this um, arrow here? So some, uh, we denote the arrows, the, the thickness of the arrow proportional to the probability. So here it is more likely to go to the left if it, if, if it doesn't receive a signal and it was in this memory state, it, uh, it has a probability of uh, detaining in that state and doing that uh, action. So you will see more later because it will be more simplified. And for the model of detection, so we used uh, two different sets of data, um, which is uh, how a smoke in air is being uh, produced in a, in a turbulent uh, wind tunnel. It's from this experiment, but in air at all. And another experiment of how um, dye in water is being uh, um, injected in a turbulent jet. So we process the data, and then we were able to um, get a model of detection. This is the, the, the final result, which gives you 
exactly the probability of getting a signal in a certain space in the arena. Okay, so that's what the setup is. And now I will tell you what are the results. So starting from the very simple one, what if you have one memory state or no memory at all? So you are just being reactive. You don't change the memory at all. So this is the optimal strategy that we, we got. So what does it do? Here, if it doesn't have, um, if it didn't receive a signal, it retains in, a, in, in that green memory, but with a sort of random work, but with a preference to go up and down. But we can see here, that's why I called it reactive strategy. Whenever it receives a signal, it always goes up, but it's only one step. Okay, and then it goes again to okay, whether to 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 get again what what should, will I receive a signal or not, and it continues. So this is a, a one a sample of a trajectory. These ones are the green the green ones are the the memory states. And then what if we add another one? So now we have two memory states. You have the option to use these two memory states during the search. And what it does is that first. Whenever it receives a signal, it goes to, to a reset state, this big green one. So you can see here, whether it is in the blue or green, whenever it receives a signal, it goes to the green. So we call it a, a reset state. But when it doesn't uh, receive a signal, if it is in the green state, it still surges up, it still goes up with a large probability. So you, you will see here like, Lengths of uh, surging up, and when it is in 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 the red one, it has a a preference of actions going left, right, or down. So it's a it's a biased random walk or or no, we call it backward random walk because it, it doesn't go up but it goes left, right, down. So this is its way to recontact re or re to find again. The, the the plume when it loses it. So this one gives about 70% success, very low trajectories. This one already gives 99% success, but still very long trajectories. We want shorter trajectories, so we add more memory. So this is what happens when we have um, three memory states. So we can see here um, what we can also see in in experiments, the the surge and um, the Cousin surge, which mods do. So as experimentally, they see this behavior of mods that um, they surge up when they um, when they receive a signal or pheromones, and then when they lose the signal, they tend to do this um, casting, going left and right. So what is interesting here is. In our model, we were able to capture this behavior and we can represent it um, by an FSC diagram. So we have here three memory states or state controllers, the yellow, the red, and the green. So as always, when it uh, um, when it receives a signal, it always goes to the green and do this uh, surging um, behavior. So the length of the surge um, can be computed by um, because um, no, can be described by a geometric distribution with the with the mean of one over the probability of, of going up the of the green state, which is in this case, um, when there is a, a no signal. So how do, does it uh, find again the pool? So in green state it, it still goes up, so it still goes up a bit, and then when it doesn't really it has a tendency or probability to go to this yellow state, which now gives you a preferred action of going to the right, right, with a small um, drift uh, downwards. And then after some time, if you still doesn't have uh, a signal, it has a probability to go to the other state, which is going to the left. So this creates the, the casting behavior. And what we can see here, is the 
is how these memories are somehow being used as a memory. Like, okay, imagine you're a researcher. If you're in the green state, it is like a clue. The green means that you are in the flume. So I am in the flume, I will just go up because I can sense the wind. The wind is going against me. So I'll go um, upwind. Okay. But when I'm in the yellow or red, it means I am somehow out of the plume, so I will search perpendicular to left and right until I see again a, a signal, I go up left and right. So that, that's how it works. And the the length here significant, significantly decreases the length of the search time. And here we have 100% uh, um, efficiency. Now, what happens when we add another memory state, four memory states? So you can see a similar behavior from the previous one, but we then added behavior, this blue thing here, which gives you uh, a random walk, which is more preferred to the left, right, and down. So here I can say that there are two levels of searching that the agent does when it loses its signal. First one is to look around me, which is this blue. And then when I really don't see it, I go to the casting behavior. And it, it shows here that in, in simulations that it, it significantly decreases the search time. <clears throat> and here we I, I show the same heat map. So now we have the green, red, and yellow as I have described before. The blue one is somehow telling you, okay, I'm close or I'm in the outskirts of the of the boundaries of this pool. So I'm just gonna search around. Okay. And here uh, we wanted to also um, show that um, this emphasis can also capture somehow a clock in the system. So th there is a if we if we plot the the time step. The, the number of time steps that has passed since the last detection of the signal, we can see here that at first it 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 uh, it is in the green memory state up to a certain uh, tau, which is in the order of fifteen to twenty, and then after some time it prefers to go to the to the blue memory states, and it has this length of uh, 30 to 40 time steps. So, and then after that, it still doesn't have a signal, then it goes to either, okay, here it refers to the red first, and then to the to the yellow, and the alternate. Okay? So that's the main message that, the, that I want to tell you, like how finite state controls can be used in, in olfactory search, and how it can be um, effective. So we tested it also to dynamic environment. So meaning we take the frames themselves and see how it uh, how it uh, how it performs in, in in each time step. Because in the previous we used a model of detection, a probabilistic model. What is the probability of getting a, a signal in that state? But here we use the frames themselves. Do I get it or do I not? Okay. And surprisingly, it actually um, it actually uh, performs better than in the model than it when we use the model. So you can see here when it's loading. Okay, even if the signal is moving, it can still um, efficiently as um, reach to the target location. This is in the smoke and air scenario. Differently from when we change the sorry. Okay. It's not going to the next slide. Okay. When we use another data, which is a dye in water, so all the figures below before I showed our results in smoking air. But when you when you optimize in dye in water, it gives you a completely uh, different uh, um behavior 
I will show you the video and then I will show you the diagram later. Okay, so it's more dispersed, the, the signals. So here it has more tendency to, to hit the walls. But what changes here is the resetting procedure. So here in smog and water, it always resets to the green one. But here in the dying water, the resetting changes. So it doesn't only set to the, to the green one. It tends to be that when you're in the yellow state and, and you receive something, you still keep going to the left. Uh, sorry, right. Probably because of the of the shape of the of the plume. So we can see here that FSCs actually adapt the the behavior according to the to the environment that you put in in the model, for example. So we also try different things like okay, if you train it in soil and air, can you test them in um in dying water and vice versa? So um what I can say is if you train it in smoking air. It uh, it can only be um, effective in the dying water if the if the signal is strong because we also have different thresholds. But when the signal is weak, then it it, it fails uh, forty to fifty percent of the time. And but if you if you have the training or, or optimized in dying water and you put it into the smoke and air, it, it works for still okay ninety to hundred percent um, efficiency. So this is, these are our conclusions and pers perspectives. So we show here that finite state controllers can be optimized to discover effective strategies. And the, as I've said before, the memory states can, can encode both the spatial and the temporal um, informations about the signals. It can also be optimized in a model free where um, I didn't show the results here, but it can also um, be optimized uh, even if you don't have uh, the f of y given s, you just have the trajectories or the the data of um, of uh, a searcher that is searching in a okay. So sorry, if you have the data of the information that the searcher receives. And lastly, as I've said, the topology of the controller have a very have a more universal structure, and it really depends on the model of detection that you you give. So. Outlooks that we've been working on lately. We were also trying to um, work out some applications to the field thing with axis. And also on the other side, so it, this is a natural question. What if you add memory states? So this is an example of a, an optimal strategy we derived for five memory states. So it tends to um, combine these behavioral um, forms or behavioral patterns in, in memory states, but adding clocks into it. So we still have to expand on that. And uh, that's it for for this uh, time. And I, I want to thank uh, Cover Mix uh, the fund, uh, for the funding of the project, QLS, ICTP, um, especially my supervisor, Anthony Chalai and Emanuela Anizan, and the physics department of the University of Trieste. And of course, the the CUNY for finding my trick. Thank you. So I'm curious about what you considered a failure in your model. Okay, so failure is uh, in in the in the in this um configuration is less than ten thousand time step, uh greater than ten thousand time step. So we we put a a T max uh that is um uh how do you say how that is proportional to the size of the animal. Okay. So I was just thinking about that in terms of like the actual animal, like the moth or the lobster if you're in the water. Yeah. yeah. Presumably they're not successful 100 percent of the time. Yes, yes. So they have some kind of internal model that they're using, but it's not gonna be perfect. And yeah. I'm wondering if you have any information about like their failure rate and if whether you could use that information to kind of fine tune yours to make it more naturalistic. I, I actually don't have a, a data for this. I don't know if I'm going to that. be very difficult. Yeah. So it's actually very difficult to compare yeah. also the results here to the experiments because there's not yet an experiment where 
simultaneously the signal and the the the, the mod itself is being um filmed. What's the project with that? So there were um studies that uh, see just the behavior of the mod, but not capturing the concentration. So for the flies they have, but they have completely different uh, action states. So one of uh, the students in, in our lab did the FSC modular office too. But it didn't quite work. <laughs> it sounds very difficult. <laughs> yes. So for the pheromone diffusion, mm -hmm. which of the two is more likely, the smoke in air model or the other one? Yeah, the smoke in air model is more is likely. More likely. Okay. And so that seems to work a lot better than the dye in what I'm testing. Well, um, what I, I showed here is that you can obtain uh, strategies in both uh, environments because there are also animals that do olfactory search in water. Yeah. So that's why we, we also included this uh, scenario. Yeah. But we didn't really compare it. Yeah, we can see that. Well, in your own, it seems that you always have to know where the wind is coming from. So you have to define your other. I'm just asking if I get uh, correct. And the second question would be in that case, in bacteria and what would be the equivalent in doing? Okay, so in, in, in the first question, so that information is actually not present in the model that I, the PRM set up. So it actually learns to go out. So the optimal uh, policy that is solved. From, from this situation, so given the the model of uh, f of uh, y model of uh, detection, given that it solves that the optim most optimal way is to go up. So it's not given in the observations that the the agent is using. Okay. Yeah. Um, because all all the initializations when you do the to solve the PMDP is uh, completely random, but somehow the optimal strategy is always to go up. So it's something that it it uh, it uh, comes out of the optimization process. And the second question in bacterial chemotactics. So we don't have the the action states in in the bacterial chemotactics that we're working on right now. It's the run and tumble, and how it responds to to chemical reagents. So it's actually more complicated than the model that I presented here. So it actually doesn't uh, um, need the, the direction. So it's a completely different uh, task because in in, in chemotactics, for example, it the goal is to eat more. It's not really to go to to a certain point. So it, <laughs> did I ask? Uh, yeah, really, really for work. Um, so you you mentioned that in terms, if you think about this in terms of like which control strategy we should use for the purposes of generalization to other scenarios, if you made it sound like the if you if you train it on the die in water mm -hmm. scenario, then it generalizes to the other scenario, but not vice versa. Is that correct? Um, not completely generalized, but uh, but does pretty well. Yeah, it, it does work well in terms of efficiency. Cool. I'm, I'm wondering, like, I mean, in, the, in a real environment, you know, in a forest where moths are flying around all the time, there's a, probably a lot of variation in the way yes, that they're yes, And I'm yes. wondering, is there like an optimal set of statistics you should learn the controller for that best generalizes to the rest of the distribution of statistics? I think we could we could do that if um, we would give them the the most difficult task, which is you don't have you don't have so much signal at all. And I think it, it, it gives like a general um, strategy to find. But it can be this can be fine-tuned if they somehow um, vary the model of detection exactly. But what, what we what what we did here also is that um, to shorten the time of the optimization, we bootstrap the the process like okay, if we have a uh, a weak signal um, scenario, 
we start from a stronger signal scenario, the one that we optimize from there, and then we optimize from, from these parameters. So we were sure that somehow it's faster to go to that. It shortens the time that's so much uh, significant. Yeah. And wait, I, have a question. I was wondering that in the two scenarios, is the information, like the mutual information, say, between the position and the signal the same? Or do you have more information in, in this when kind of scenario? I think that the, the dye in water could be a more a difficult uh, task than the other one mm -hmm. because somehow the, the signal are more dispersed. So there is a lot of time that you um, you, you collect uh, this information. It's also one problem of like a, a strategy that I showed here by the I didn't mention it with input access. It gives confusion when when you get more information for example. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Follow up to this question is it just because like in the by example that you have less information or the same information is harder to get? Can you speak sorry? So in in, 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 in in this for the same question, you know, like when you have a dive in in the, mm -hmm. in the medium. So is it harder because the information content is less? So the information between the stimulus and the system is less, or because it is just harder, you know, like like the speed that is high, you're yeah. not able to get to that. Yeah, I think it would be the second one. Because there are more like uh, different patches all over. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe this is unfair because it's a very general question. I always have this problem when people talk about approaches that involve a model and approach to put our model free. Okay. I wonder, is it clear that the model free approaches don't have an implicit model? I mean, in the when people talk about model based approaches, it, you mean you can really talk, you can point to the model, right? And maybe even you're going to have access to it. Mm -hmm. But in the model free approaches, there are various parameters, there are internal states. Mm -hmm. Are we sure that those don't constitute some, some sort of implicit model where if I looked at all those parameters, I could figure out, you know, I could build a model to distribute my current knowledge of the distribution of the source or something? Well, somehow in the model free approaches, um, what technique that they use, they a build uh, uh, an approximate of the model. But uh, I'm not sure if I was clear here, but when I say the model here, it, it's the model of the, of the env environment. So it could be um, if the agent knows the P of S5 minus A, meaning the, the, where it goes if it does this action, or if the model if they know the model of detection. So in the model three, I'm talking about, okay, what if I don't have an idea at all of the environment? The only way that I could get information is when I experience it. So that's what I mean with model three. If, 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 if you were to use it, do you need to use it in some way that assumes some kind of smoothness or something yeah. that's sort of implicit? Yes, you could build heuristic models for um, model three um, approach. For example, Bukowski and Schreiman have this model of gap and search where they um, they just have this internal clock that counts how many times before did I not uh, be seen. So I keep uh, increasing the length of the of the casting, but then um, after some time, if, if I see a, a signal. Then I go up and then I pass again. So maybe I can show it here. Can you ask for something that is like, like at least it can be continuous? You know, like, like it's not a lot to ask. Or, well, I don't know. I just, I, I always have this problem. Like, there's a sort of persistent confusion. <laughs> <laughs> and as I say, I, that may be not fair to ask you to, to resolve it for me. Yes. <laughs> but, um, I feel like sometimes, you know, the, the, 
the model for you to do there. You are assuming something about the world. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep. I mean, otherwise you have a collection of thoughts. Yeah. Yep. And there's no way to connect them, right? So. So it 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 boils down into how do you use the the thoughts that we get. Yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, why, why do you have casting from the left to the right, but not uh, up and down? Like, I didn't actually, like, from the pictures, I didn't really understand, like, when you're looking at the smoke, like, mm -hmm. you can see, uh, like, it's more like in 2D space, mm -hmm. but, like, how is it distributed across the uh, height? Because if you're flying, you're going up, for example, but, like, Will the concentration when you go up will it change or will it change or so this is one limitation of, of our study because we only consider it today. So mm -hmm. in TV it's completely um, different uh, um, behaviors that you would uh, you would see for example. Ah oh, so possibly if you model is 3D you would be also yes yeah, yeah. Hello everyone uh so I'm the, the last one before food standing between you and the food yet at the same time, I could be stalling somehow. So uh, let's see how this will end up. Uh, I am Islam, I am a PhD candidate at Emory University, uh, working with Ilya Nimenman. And today I will be talking to you about uh, simultaneous dimensionality reduction and how it could be a way of dealing with neuroscience uh, data complexity or just like data complexity in general when you have more than one modality in the data. So, uh, just to start with, with an example, you know, like in this example, the, the, the monkey is, you know, like like recording its activity, like the muscle activity, and then it's reaching and grasping something and recording the real activity at the same time. And the output of such an experiment would be something that looks like this. For the neural activity, you have like a lot of like like recordings uh, for multiple neurons. Right now, uh, I put papers that they're recording up to a million uh, neurons in the brain, so a big dimensional system and a behavior that can be low or high dimensional as it can get. So this could be the muscle activity. And, you know, like in order to write a model or something like that, uh, you do some form of dimensionality reduction. Okay? You're not writing a model for a million for a million dimension. Uh, so you can do either linear methods like, like PCA or factor analysis or something on the neural activity. And then you do the same thing for the other side if it is high dimensional. Uh, or you can do fancy nonlinear current neural network stuff like the LFAS and stuff like that. But the point is you do dimensional reduction on the first side and then dimensional reduction on the other side, and then you try to see correlations between them. However, and I, I, I like this quote, this is from a, uh, a review by Adrian Perhal and others. Uh, they're saying, because you know, like the brain does what the brain does. So maybe I'm recording from here right now, but there are internal states and you know, like I'm hungry. And at the same time, you know, like the part I'm recording from is communicating with other parts in the brain. And at the same time, the behavior is not totally controlled by the part I'm recording. So there is the environment reacting to me and a lot of things. So it would be nice if there, if there is a way to do a reduction that keeps from my neural data what is relevant for the behavior. And that keeps from the behavior what is relevant for the neural data I am recording. Uh, this was 2016, but thank God we're not 2016 anymore. Uh, specifically with the development of neural networks and those cool AI methods, there have been, you know, like the thorough of those methods that uh, some of them are just like a couple of days ago, uh, and probably you'll have more that does this kind of like relevant reduction or targeted reduction. So it keeps from the neural activity what is relevant for the behavior and vice versa by some clever methods that are not the scope of here. However, in some of those examples, it is mentioned, oh yeah, that's, that's just one of them, you know, like you dissect your data into part that is behaviorally relevant and part that is behaviorally irrelevant. And then, you know, like the, you're able to do better basically with some metrics that we measure. But the part that I'm, I'm interested at here is when they mention this somewhere in the appendix saying that this method, we call it PSID, it figures out uh, the dynamics, okay? Or like gives you the states that correspond to the shared dynamics in lower dimensional spaces and using orders of magnitude fewer data samples. So this is pretty cool, you know, like you, you basically get more with doing less. And it wasn't mentioned only in this kind of literature even, you know, like not in neuroscience. This is from totally different field, a method called PLS, which is doing something similar to what I mentioned in a less fancy way. And this is journal of information management or something like that, it doesn't matter. But you're saying that when you use this method that does this for you, also, you know, like need fewer uh, number of samples. So 
this sets up our question. Does applying this simultaneous reduction actually require fewer number of samples? And it figures out the shared signal or what is relevant for your system in fewer number of dimensions. And if this is true, can we understand this, you know, like a more principled way, not just a bunch of observations here and there? And can we understand or use use this understanding to build better methods? And spoiler alert, hopefully, you know, like our trial to answering this question, it says yes. So this would be two parts. The first one would be trying to answer the first two questions. And then the second part would be, can you use this to build better methods? So uh, we want to understand this in a simplistic way that if our intuition and math did not work here, okay, we will have rough time trying to make it work for more complex scenarios. So we built a generative linear model where you have some data, X and Y, where you have T observations, T samples that you code for, and NX and NY dimensions. And it consists of three parts. The first one is noise, random noise in all of the dimensions. The second part is some self-signal, which is, you know, like if, if, if you are thinking about the brain again, could be, you know, like just the intervariability in the thing that you are recording. And the third part is a shared signal. And you have M self for, for X and Y and M shared between both. And you crank this one up or down by some signal to noise ratio, uh, call it self signal to noise ratio, and this one up and down by some shared signal to noise ratio. And the then we would apply some form of dimensionality reduction. And here we make the clarification more clear, hopefully. We separate the two approaches, independent dimensionality reduction and simultaneous. In both situations, you have two, probably more than two modalities, X and Y, and they have some information between them, but they are high dimensional. You cannot effectively, you know, like measure dimension or do some modeling on that, and you want to reduce them to some latent spaces, ZX and ZY. For independent dimensionality reduction, you do it for X, and then you do it for Y, and then you ask what is the correlation that I have between both. And the canonical example here would be the PCA. We're doing some singular value decomposition of the covariance matrix of X with itself and for Y with itself. On the other hand, the simultaneous, or what we call simultaneous dimensional reduction, you do it simultaneously at the same time. So by construction, ZX is maximally correlated or covarying with ZY. And the example that I will be using right now is something called regularized canonical correlation analysis which is just and instead of optimizing optimizing for variance for PCA, you are optimizing for correlation with the regularization for, uh, for, for, for the simultaneous reduction. And then the procedure for the next few uh, results will be the following. You take your X and Y, which have like T samples and high dimension, and then you want to get your ZX and ZY. So you feed them to some method to get them, and then you calculate some form of adjusted normalized correlation. Basically, it is zero if your ZX and ZY have no correlation with each other, and it is one if they are maximally correlated with one another. And then we vary some parameters for that. So the setup that we have is we have a thousand uh, dimensions in X and Y, so it's a relatively high dimensional system, and you have one shared signal, okay? Like it's a simple enough thing, not that simple, you know, like it's a needle in a haystack, but it's just one signal you are looking for. And you have 300 samples, so it's an undersampled situation. You cannot invert the covariance matrix right here. And then we vary the number of self signals that we add that supposedly we don't care about. We care only about the shared signal. And then we vary the number of latent dimensions that we are keeping. So, you know, like when you're doing PCA, you say, oh, I have 90% of the variance after let's say five components or 10 components and so on. So we vary the number of components that we are keeping. And the results would look something like this. Uh, here I'm reporting the number of self signals and the number of shared signals. So how many self signals I have in my system and how many dimensions I'm keeping. And on the x-axis, I am dialing up the self-signal. So, you know, like how strong is my x talking to itself versus the y-axis, which is how strong my x is talking to y. And the first panel would be PCA, you know, like the independent dimensional reduction. And the second one would be the simultaneous dimensional reduction, which is the regularized CCA. And here it is just what is the correlations that I would get just by chance, having two totally random matrices, what is the correlation between them? And the two color bars are saying how, how much is this my generalized correlation is, or not generalized, normalized correlation is. So in the first situation, we have only one self signal. Okay, so we have one short signal, one self signal. We start by keeping only one dimension. We notice that PCA is not able to penetrate into this side of the phase space. So if you're keeping one dimension, and this dimension happened to be strong uh, compared to, to, to like it has 
more shared signal than a self signal, then PCA will pick it up. But if it is weak, you will not be able to pick it up. Compared to R RCCA, which is figuring out this correlation with almost perfect reconstruction in the whole phase space. But then you say, okay, like I'm not keeping one principal component. Let's add one more. You add one more, you find out that PCA is able right now to, to reconstruct everything. Good. PCA, RCCA doing the same. But what if I have a lot of self signals? So my X has a lot of talking with, with, with itself, but it still have only one shared signal that is talking to Y. So in total, we have 31 signals, one of them shared, 30 of them are not. We do the same procedure, we keep only one dimension, and we notice that PCA is not able to penetrate, even it got more confused before it was able to get to here, while RCCA, no problem, nothing changed. So we do the same trick, we add more dimensions so that we are having more correlation, and let's add up to 30 dimensions. You know, like we have 31 signals, so let's add up to 30 dimensions, less than the one that we need with one. We notice here two things. The first thing is that the correlation due to, like the noise due to just random fluctuation become very, very high, like, like more than the value that could ever possibly be. Because again, remember, you are trying to estimate a covariance matrix of 30 times 30 dimensions from just 300 samples. So by noise, you will get a lot of random correlations. And at the same time, PCA, I'm not sure if the light is doing me a favor right here, is not able to penetrate to this part. Once I add this magical dimension, so right now I am keeping 31 dimensions and I have 31 uh, signals, PCA is able to cover this part. Yet everything is doing terribly less because you know, like you have a lot of dimensions you're trying to estimate from only 300 samples. So it seems like a sampling situation. So I say to my experimentalist friend, please go back to the lab, record more samples. They go there and they add 10 times more samples. Same scenario, but just 10 times more samples. Very hard, very costly, but they did it for me. Thank you. Uh, of course, this is not experimental. This is just all synthetic data from the model. Just making the, uh, the analogy here. So if I'm keeping 30 dimensions, right now we see it clearly, PCA is not able to penetrate to this part at all. Or CCA is covering the whole space yet with low reconstruction because you know, like you're trying to estimate 30 dimensions from 300 samples, but uh, no, from 3,000 samples. But once you add this one more magical dimension, PCA is able to recover the whole space. So to detect any signal, and this is a summary of my part one, you need two requirements. The first one is that you need to have sufficient number of dimensions you're keeping. So you cannot just be arbitrarily saying, I'm keeping 10 dimensions after my reduction. No, you need to think more a bit about this. And you need sufficient number of samples to sample those dimensions well enough. So in all of what I'm saying, it didn't matter that much what is the original dimensionality of my system. Because the original, because my system had already intrinsic low dimensional uh, like description right there. So what matters is, you know, like the number of low dimensions I'm keeping and I need to be sampling them well enough. And the independent reduction does not see a difference between, you know, like uh, like self signal and shared signals. So the number of the number of dimensions you're keeping is somewhere between the shared signals and the total number of signals that you have. Depending on your luck, if you have a lot of shared signals and one self signal, so no problem. But if you're not lucky, you're not in a good situation because you need to have a lot of dimensions to keep. And a lot of dimensions come with the problem is that you have more noise because you have less number of samples. But for SDR, it only sees shared signal. It goes straight to them. So this would be the good thing to do. And the important parameters that we find from this with more details uh, in the paper is, you know, like the, depending on the number of self to shared signals that you have, then your reduction will be. So if this Q parameter is high, it means that you're going to your shared signals quickly. And the the used self to signal to noise ratio, so which is basically where you are in the phase space. If your signals, your shared signal is strong or your shared signal is weak compared to the other one. And the last one, which is the more important one, which is the number of samples per dimensions you're keeping. So it doesn't matter that much how many dimensions do you have in your original data. What matters is how many, how many samples you have per dimension you're keeping. And uh, more you know, like like speaking about this uh, in the paper, it's under review right now. Hopefully, we'll see it in ink soon. Uh, more 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 details with more like careful investigations and why is this happening? So, this was for part one. You know, like it's a linear example. What we get from that is, if we care about the shared signal in my system, then maybe I should be doing simultaneous reduction, not independent reduction.
For the second part, we're still trying to answer the same question. Can we understand this behavior in a more principled way? And can we use this understanding right now to build better methods? So, you know, like PCA is great. People are still using PCA till now. But in some scenarios, PCA will not do you any good if your data is non-linear. So for the second part, we want to design a nonlinear method that does this simultaneous reduction for us. Remember, this was our diagram from before. And a plausible approach or a method would be the multivariate information bottleneck. Uh, I will be explaining what is that in a second, but the key idea is that you have your X and Y, you want to reduce them to ZX and ZY, and this method that Bill with TFP and others who were uh, like, like introduced before, like 20 something years ago. Uh, but the problem with, with, with this approach as is, is that information is hard to estimate on its own. You know, like you need to sample the space very well enough so that you're able to get the probability distribution, as I will explain in the next slide. And it is theoretically beautiful, but the practicality of it is, is limited. Till 2017, where there was this paper by Alexander Alimi and others, which they implemented something called deep variational information bottleneck, which is, you know, like going from having hard time estimating neutral information, still it's hard time till now, to, you know, like a more neural network, uh, what is the word? Neural network uh, inspired way. So they use variational approximations and deep neural networks to parameterize the information bottleneck. And this method was both theoretically principled and potentially practically useful. So what is the information bottleneck? It is just, you have your X, you are reducing it for Z, and then you are using Z to reconstruct Y. So basically it is a trade-off between how much you are compressing and how much you are passing through this bottleneck to reconstruct. The symmetric information bottleneck, which is just some uh, special form of the multivariate information bottleneck has this loss, which is, you know, like you're maximizing, yeah, let me hide this. And I cannot hide this. Uh, oh yeah, from here. Okay, tight. So this metric information bottleneck, you are you are you are compressing x to z, you are compressing y to z y, and you are maximizing the information between z x and z y. Using the first one for the information bottleneck itself, you know, like in, in the deep variational information bottleneck, they wrote a, a lower bound for the encoder that goes from x to z, an upper bound for from z to y, and then approximated them with a variational using variational tricks, and they got the deep variational information bottleneck. So from a first glance, we just want to have a deep variational symmetric information bottleneck. But the problem is, if we want to just simply replace, like do the same tricks that they did, we will have a problem that there is nothing that prevents my ZX and ZY just being a uniform distribution. And this was shown. Uh, among other calculations on the sample efficiency of the symmetric versus the regular information bottleneck in this paper by my collaborator, just published in Neural Computations. Uh, interesting read. So this, this, this told us, you know, like we need to step back a little bit and think. The original information bottleneck was actually done on DAGs, on directed acyclic graphs, not just the information terms. So thinking about this, it is an interpolation between a compression, which is in our nomenclature that we have right now from neural networks and so on, an encoder and a decoder. So it is not just, you know, like losses, the I between X and Z and I, Y and Z. No, it is an interpolation between an encoder which compresses and a decoder that is trying to reconstruct your signal from a compressed representation. And each of those terms is either an encoder or a decoder that you can implement using a neural network. And this was actually the original information bottleneck idea that you have two graphs. They're not just two terms, they're two graphs. So, but right now the graphs, we can write them as like, we, we can write a variational approximation for them and we can implement them using a neural network. And that's what we did for the symmetric information bottleneck. So this loss, if we try to implement it, it would be in a problem, but realizing that this loss is just a pair of two encoders and a pair of decoders with a cross term so it has the first line, just an encoding, and then the second and third line, they are decoding, then we can have the deep variational symmetric information bottleneck. So 
from this, just getting back to the origin of, 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 of the method, we can easily rederive some of the known methods like the variational autoencoders and variational information bottleneck just by considering them as an encoder and decoder that we are interpolating between them. And generalizing other methods, you know, like that we're driven from, let's say, like likelihood assumptions, like the, the variational canonical correlation analysis, which is this method right here, which is actually interesting if you care about just one space. If you don't need two spaces, so this metric information button it gives you two spaces, ZX and ZY. One could be the latent representation for neural activity, and one could be the one for behavior. But if you just consider one of them, let's say you are considering like the evolving of something, you don't need two spaces, you just need one. That could be a proper method to do. And we introduced a new method, the deep variation and symmetric information bottleneck, which is using this uh, graph that I was just saying right here. So uh, as, as, as a spring break bonus, uh, make your own method. You know, like just draw a diagram of how you want to factorize your encoder and decoder. You have the loss terms mentioned in the paper. Just put them together. They correspond to a block of code that you compile with like few copies and pastes, and then you have a new method. And actually, when we submitted this, we got revisions, and then the reviewers was like, what about this method? What about that method? Some of them were like multimodal and so on and so forth. And we even realized more at that time that we can encapsulate almost all of those methods within the framework. Just draw your encoder graph and your decoder graph and interpolate or convex interpolate between them, and you have your new method, and it can be implemented like this. Like, like literally like this, it's copying a few lines of code and you have the new method right there. So just to show some results, that's uh, some results computer science people like. They train or they benchmark the methods on some data set called MNIST. And MNIST is just handwritten digits and people took pictures of that and then they labeled it. Say this picture is zero, this picture is one, this picture is two, and so on and so forth. So what we did is that we grouped all the zeros together, all the ones, twos, and so on. And then we did some two separate transformations. On one of them, which is the one to the left, we rotated and scaled the thing. And on the other one, we added background correlated noise. So then we feed the two sides. Those right now became my X's and Y's. The only thing that is shared between them is just the identity of the label, that this is a letter one, this is a letter two. And then we feed them to our, mo our model. And then out of a lot of other methods, they perform the best. Uh, we actually did not do any fine tuning for this. They just give us good subspaces that when you do classification on them, you get higher accuracy than others. And with more, like more interestingly, this is a this is a generative model. You have a generative model right now for for for, for going from the latent space to x's and y's again. So those are, are are figures that are generated just from a point in your latent space. Those are not actual figures. Those are not real one in the training set. We just took our decoders. We give it a seed and we said, generate figures for me. So you can generate from the distribution that you learned. You can generate more and more samples from that. And uh, the thing that we started the talk with are that is, is it more sample efficient? And yes, when compared to something like the AEs, you know, like this is here, this is the accuracy. We, we see that it approaches, you know, like the maximum accuracy with higher slope uh, as a function of the number of samples that you're keeping. So we verified empirically the theoretical findings that were there. So to sum up, we have a framework right now. This is summary for part two that can easily capture various dimensionality reduction methods. We can design new methods with relative ease, just you know, like draw the encoder and, and, and decoder graph, and then you can implement them. And the new method, the deep variation and symmetric information bottleneck, is a pretty long thing. We should work on that. Mm -hmm. This is the first one up to our knowledge that gives you two distinct subspaces that are still maximally informative about one another. So you can have other methods that give you two spaces, but not distinct. They give you two latent, two latent representations, but they are on the same space. This makes a difference if you want to compress two things with two different units that you don't want them to mix. So we can do this with, 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 the, with DBSIP. And the results are promising in terms of quality of latent spaces, like they give us higher classification accuracy, and they give us better sample size, uh, uh, better sample scaling. And the paper is also under review right now. Hopefully, we we'll also see it in ink soon. Uh, so the take-home message: If you care about finding a shared signal between two, two data sets, using simultaneous dimensional reduction is the right thing to do. Not easily doing PCA and then building on that. 
maybe we need to think more before using PCA right now. And the simultaneous reduction, it, it figures out the shared signal using fewer number of dimensions with higher accuracy when compared to their uh, independent reduction uh, counterparts. And then on the other side, using the deep multivariate information bottleneck framework, which is just the generalization for the, for the multivariate information bottleneck using variational approximations and deep neural networks, we can design multiple problem specific methods. DBSIF was one of those examples. And this DBSIF, it has better desirable features, which is like two distinct maximally informative subspaces and better sampling efficiency. That is proved both analytically by our collaborators and empirically. And if you want to hear more about the, like this framework and using it for other things, uh, that's my collaborator's talk at APS. And my talk would be using this to actually estimate mutual information, you know, like in high dimensional spaces, efficiency, efficiently. And uh, to acknowledge, uh, this work was done with, uh, with my advisor, Elena Minman, and my collaborator, Michael Martini, and my other collaborator, Ahmed Roman. Uh, and this is my group because they're cool people. And we thank the funding agency and organizers for giving me the opportunity to present this for you guys. And with that, I will be happy to take some questions. Yes. Well, when you showed the correlation matrix at the beginning, what did it, it to me? It looked like the correlations were larger than one. I think I yes. that confused me. Is that was I reading it wrong? Or? No, you're not reading it wrong. That is actually true because you are and you are under in in under sample. You know, like if you have infinite data, the correlation should be zero between two random matrices, right? But if you do not have random data, let's say you just have ten points in a ten-dimensional space, you could have those ten points aligning along one of the directions just by chance. And then every one of them is contributing to you with one. So in under sample situations, you can have some of correlations more than one at the end. But when you go to infinite sample, like when you add more samples, this thing goes down. So that's actually one of the problems that your 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 randomness or your noise contribution is more than the signal can possibly be. So. I think maybe this is a question that comes for the next thing that you do. Yes. About, when you gave the example of trying to do simultaneous relational algorithms with neurons and behavior, one of the challenges is that I presume my internal neural state not only encodes what I'm doing right now, yes. it also encodes my plan yeah. far into the future. Right? Yes. So, and, and if I throw that away, I might be throwing away things that are really interesting. In fact, maybe more interesting than I mean, the, my encoding of what I'm doing right now is just about motor control, whereas my encoding of what I plan on doing in the distant future is about cognition, thoughts, and whatever. So, can you give sort of, I mean, but, but then that requires enormous potentially enormous windows of the behavior even yeah. if you have so it's not just a thousand neurons now call them your nearest time t well you might you might be willing to say i want to know what's encoded in my brain at this moment mm -hmm. so that it's really only the thousand neurons or hundred thousand neurons or whatever but in terms of behavior i might want a very large window so how do you how do you think about that so Actually, this is one of the questions that we thought about, and this is one of the applications that we're working on, still not like totally uh, right yet, which is like how, how to get those dynamical variables. Because, you know, like if you're considering this exact time, time step, you cannot infer anything more than the position. But if you are considering the next time step in your data, right now you can consider like the first derivative, like you can estimate derivatives based on that. So the idea would be you need to have not just x or x of t. You should have x of t, x of t plus one, x of t plus two, which is coming with its own problems because right now I discretize my space and I said what matters is only the next time step or the one after that. And if I want to care about everything in the future, I need to include up to how, you know, like like longer, longer time steps right there. But in principle, you can be having on one side more than one time point and then allowing the method to figure out what kind of like, 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 like correlations that are happening between those two multiple multiple time points or that 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 you are feeding it. So basically you have a more not just one encoding or decoding, you have multiples of them at different time points. 
and, and it works actually, you know, like if you feed one time, I mean, when, when you try to feed the data that is at X of T, then we get only, you know, like positions, but when we add concatenate, simply concatenate X of T and X of T plus one and feed it to our model, like to our X, we are able to figure out the first derivative of like the, some of the dynamical examples that we use. Does it make sense? Sure. I guess the other question I have is, let's talk about this a little bit too, but in the original formulation, it's very spot on that, right? I, yes. I compress X to preserve information about Y. Yes. And but here you're saying, no, 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 I want to compress both X and Y to look at compressed variables of information about each other. Yes. So I could think about doing the information bottleneck twice, right? I could compress X to preserve information about Y, and I could compress Y to preserve information about X. That is totally valid, but... And do I... I realize there are issues about sampling. Yes. Um, but is it clear that that's different? So... You can you can do two independent bottles. And the first thing that he said is sampling. Yeah, I mean so the so let's separate the issue. One is is that actually a different principle? I don't think it is, but right now uh, no, I, I don't I don't think it's a separate issue. I, I don't think it's uh, it, it is something that is like 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 distinct. You will get the same things in the limit of infinite samples, I think. I mean I mean the way that we developed this in the first place was to estimate mutual information, you know, because Right. Two bottlenecks, you have one Z and one Z, and then you need to estimate information between both. But right now, you have the information as actually as a side product of your of your compression right there. So it's, this was designed as an efficient way of estimating control information, and it happened out to be great dimension reduction as well. So, but I, I think if you have infinite samples, there's nothing that prevents from doing two independent uh, like right, regular bottlenecks, which we actually consider some of those examples. 